Soul of the Fire by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 176. He ached to be with a woman, but couldn't figure how the embarrassment of the situation wouldn't ruin the lust of it. Maybe if it was a girl he knew and liked, and he kissed and cuddled and courted her for a period of time, came to know her well, he might see how he could get to the point of the procedure, but he couldn't imagine how anyone ever worked up the nerve to go to a woman he didn't even know and just strip naked right in front of her. Maybe it was dark. Maybe that was it. Maybe it was dark in the prostitute's rooms, so the two people wouldn't actually see each other. But he still... Fitch. Fitch cleared his throat. No, sir. I swear in an oath not to go to any of the prostitutes in Fairfield. No, sir, I won't. Chapter 24 After the boy left, Dalton yawned. He had been up long before dawn, calling in staff, meeting with trusted assistants to hear their reports of any relevant discussions at the feast, and then seeing about the preparation of all the messages. The staff employed in the copying and preparation of messages, among other things, took up the next six rooms down the hall, but they had needed his outer offices to complete the task in such short order. By first light, Dalton had his messengers off to the criers in every corner of Andereth. Later, when the minister was up and had finished with whoever had ended up as his bed partner, Dalton would let the man know the wording of the statement so he might not be taken by surprise, seeing as how he was the signatory to the announcement. The criers would read the messages in meeting halls, guild halls, merchant and trade halls, town and city council halls, taverns, inns, every army post, every university, every worship service, every penance assembly, every fulling, paper and grain mill, every market square, anywhere people gathered, from one end of Andereth to the other. Within a matter of days, the message, the exact message as Dalton had written it, would be in every ear. Criers who didn't read the messages exactly as written were sooner or later reported and replaced with men more interested in keeping their source of extra income. Besides sending the messages to the criers, Dalton, on a rotating basis, sent identical messages to people about the land who earned a bit of extra money by listening to the crier and reporting if the message was altered, all part of tending his cobweb. Few people understood, as did Dalton, the importance of a precisely tailored, cogent-sounding, uniform message reaching every ear. Few people understood the power wielded by the one controlling the words people heard. What people heard, if put to them properly, they believed, regardless of what were those words. Few people understood the weapon that was a properly fashioned twist of information. Now there was a new law in the land. Law forbidding partial hiring practices in the mason profession, and ordering the hiring of willing workers who presented themselves for work. The day before, such action against a powerful guild would have been unthinkable. His messages chided people to act by the highest ander cultural ideals and not to take understandably belligerent action against Masons for their past despicable practices of being a party to children starving. Instead, his message insisted that they follow the new higher standards of the Winthrop Fair Employment Law and the startled Masons, rather than attacking the new law, would be busily and vigorously trying to prove that they were not intentionally starving the children of their neighbors. Before long, Masons across the land would not only comply, but embrace the new law, as if they themselves had all along been urging its passage. It was either that or be stoned by angry mobs. Dalton liked to consider every eventuality and have the road laid before the cart arrived. By the time Rowley got Fitch cleaned up and into messenger livery, and the boy off on his way with a law pouch, it would be too late for the Office of Cultural Amity, if for some reason the eleven directors changed their minds, to do anything about it. The criers would already be proclaiming the new law all over Fairfield, and soon it would be known far and wide. None of the eleven directors would now be able to alter their show of hands at the feast. Fitch would fit right in with the rest of Dalton's messengers, they were all men he had collected over the previous ten years, young men pulled from obscure places, otherwise doomed to a life of hard labor, degradation, few options, and little hope. They were the dirt under the heels of Andereth culture. Now, through the delivery of messages to criers, they helped shape and control Andereth culture. The messengers did more than merely deliver messages. In some ways, they were almost a private army, paid for by the public, and one of the means by which Dalton had risen to his present post. 
All his messengers were unshakably loyal to no one but Dalton. Most would willingly go to their death if he requested it. There had been occasions when he had. Dalton smiled as his thoughts wandered to more pleasant things. Wandered to Teresa. She was floating on air from having been introduced to the sovereign. When they had returned to their apartments after the feast and retired to bed, as she had promised, she had soundly rewarded him with just how good she could be. And Teresa could be extraordinarily good. She had been so inspired by the experience of meeting the sovereign that she was spending the morning in prayer. He doubted she could have been more moved had she met the creator himself. Dalton was pleased that he could provide Teresa with such an exalting experience. At least she had not fainted as had several women and one man when they were presented to the sovereign. Were it not a common occurrence, it would have been embarrassing for those people. As it was, everyone understood and readily accepted their reaction. In some ways, it was a mark of distinction, a talisman of faith, proving one's devotion to the Creator. No one considered it anything but sincere faith laid bare. Dalton, however, recognized the sovereign as the man he was, a man in a high office, but a man nonetheless. For some people, though, he transcended such worldly notions. When Bertrand Chanbor, a man already widely respected and admired as the most outstanding minister of culture ever to serve, became sovereign, he too would become the object of mindless adoration. Dalton suspected, though, that a great many of the swooning women would be endeavoring to fall under him rather than faint before him. To many, it would be a religious experience beyond the mere coupling with a man of power, such as the minister of culture. Even husbands would be ennobled by their wives' holy acceptance into such congress with the sovereign. When he heard a knock at the door, Dalton looked up and began to say, Enter, but the woman was already barging in. It was Franca Gowenlock. Dalton rose. Ah, Franca, how good to see you. Did you enjoy the feast? For some reason, the woman had a dark look. Added to her dark eyes and hair, and the general aspect which made her seem as if she were somehow always standing in a shadow, even when she wasn't, that made the look very dark indeed. The air always seemed to still and cool whenever Franca was about. She snatched the top rail of a chair on her way past, dragging it along to his desk. She set the chair before the desk, plopped herself down in front of him, and folded her arms. Somewhat taken aback, Dalton sank back into his chair. Fine lines splayed out from her squinted eyes. I don't like that one from the Order, Stein. I don't like him one bit. Dalton relaxed back into his chair. Franca wore her black, nearly shoulder-length hair loose, yet it swept back somewhat from her face, as if it had been frozen stiff by an icy wind. A bit of gray streaked her temples, but rather than adding years to her looks, it added only to her serious mien her simple sienna dress buttoned to her neck. A little higher up, a band of black velvet hugged her throat. It was usually black velvet, but not always. Whatever it was made from, it was always at least two fingers wide. Because she always wore a throat band, Dalton wondered all the more why and what, if anything, might be under it. Franca being Franca, he never asked. He had known Franca Gowenlock for nearly 15 years and had employed her talents for well over half that time. He had sometimes mused to himself that she must have once been beheaded and sewn her own head back on. I'm sorry, Franca. Did he do something to you? Insult you? He didn't lay a hand to you, did he? I will have him dealt with if that's the case. You have my word. Franca knew his word to her was beyond reproach. She twined her long, graceful fingers together in her lap. He had enough women willing and eager. He didn't need me for that. Dalton, truly at a loss, but cautious nonetheless, spread his hands. Then what is it? Franca put her forearms on the desk and tipped her head in. She lowered her voice. He did something with my gift. He scrambled it all up or something. Dalton blinked, true concern roiling through him. You mean you think the man has some kind of magical power? That he cast a spell or something? I don't know, Franca growled, but he did something. How do you know? I tried to listen to conversations at the feast, just like I always do. I tell you, Dalton, I wouldn't know I had the gift if I didn't know I did. Nothing. I got nothing from no one. Not a thing. 
Dalton's frown now mimicked hers. You mean that your gift didn't help you overhear anything? Don't you hear anything? Isn't that what I just said? Dalton drummed his fingers on the table. He turned and peered out the window. He got up and lifted the sash, letting in the warm breeze. He motioned to Franca, and she came around the desk. Dalton pointed to two men engaged in conversation under a tree across the lawn. Down there, those two. Tell me what they're saying. Franca put her hands on the sill and leaned out a little, staring at the two men. The sun on her face showed how time truly was beginning to wrinkle, stretch, and sag what he had always thought was one of the most beautiful, if not the strangest, women he had ever known. Even so, despite the advance of time, her beauty was still haunting. Dalton watched the men's hands move, gesturing as they spoke, but he could hear none of their words. With her gift, she should be able to easily hear them. Franca's face went blank. She stood so still, she looked like one of the wax figures from the traveling exhibition that came through Fairfield twice a year. Dalton couldn't even tell if the woman was breathing. She finally pulled an annoyed breath. Can't hear a word. They're too far away to see their lips, so I can't get any help by that. But still, I don't hear a thing, and I should. Dalton looked down, close to the building, three stories below. What about those two? Franca leaned out for a look. Dalton could almost hear them himself. A chuckle rose up, and an exclamation, but no more. Franca again went still. This time, the breath she pulled bordered on rage. Nothing, and I can almost hear them without the gift. Dalton closed the window. The anger went out of her face in a rush, and he saw something he had never before seen from her. Fear. Dalton, you have to get rid of that man. He must be a wizard or something. He's got me all tied up in knots. How do you know it's him? She blinked twice at the question. Well, what else could it be? He claims to be able to eliminate magic. He's only been here a few days, and I've only had this problem a few days. Have you had trouble with other things, other aspects of your gift? She turned away, wringing her hands. A few days ago, I made up a little spell for a woman who came to me. A little spell so she would have her moon flow back and not be pregnant. This morning, she returned and said it didn't work. Well, it must be a complex kind of conjuring. There must be a lot involved. I expect such things don't always work. She shook her head. It always worked before. Perhaps you're ill. Have you felt different of late? I feel exactly the same. I feel like my power is as strong as ever. It should be, but it's not. Other charms have failed too. I'd not let this go without testing it, thorough-like. Troubled, Dalton leaned closer. Franca, I don't know a lot about it, but maybe some of it is just coincidence in yourself. Maybe you just have to believe you can do it for it to work again. She glared back over her shoulder. Where do you ever get such a daft notion about the gift? I don't know, Dalton shrugged. I admit I don't know a great deal about magic, but I really don't believe Stein has the gift, or any magic about him. He's just not the sort. Besides, he's not even here today. He couldn't be interrupting your ability hearing those people down there. He went out to tour the countryside. He's been gone for hours. She slowly rounded on him, looking fearsome and at the same time frightened. Such opposing aspects at the same time gave him goose flesh. Then I fear, she whispered, that I've simply lost my power. I'm helpless. Franca, I'm sure, she licked her lips. You have Seren Rajak locked away in chains, don't you? I'd not like to think of him or his lunatic followers. I told you before, we have him in chains. I'm not even sure he's still alive. After all this time, I doubt it. But either way, there is no need to worry about Seren Rajak. Staring off, she nodded. He touched her arm. Franca, I'm certain your power will return. Try not to be overly concerned. Tears welled in her eyes. Dalton, I'm terrified. Cautiously, he took the weeping woman in his consoling arms. She was... After all, besides being a dangerous, gifted woman, a friend. The words from the song at the feast came to mind. Came the thieves of the charm and spell. Chapter 25 
Roberta lifted her chin high in the air, stretching her neck to guardedly peer off past the brink of the cliff not far away and look out over the fertile fields of her beloved Narif Valley far below. Freshly plowed fields were a deep rich brown among breathtakingly bright green carpets of new crops and the darker verdant pastures where livestock, looking like tiny slow ants, cropped at tender new grass. The Damar River meandered through it all, sparkling in the early morning sunshine, escorted along its route by a gathering of dark green trees, as if they'd come to watch the river's showy parade. Whenever she went up in the woods near Nesting Cliff, she had herself a look from afar, just to see the pretty valley below. After allowing herself that brief look, she always lowered her eyes to the shaded forest floor at her feet, the leaf litter, and mossy stretches among dappled sunlight, where the ground was firm and comforting. Roberta shifted the sack slung over her shoulder and moved on. As she maneuvered through the clear patches among the huckleberry and hawthorn, stepped on stones set like islands among dark crevices and holes, and ducked under low pine boughs and alder limbs, she flipped aside with her walking stick a fern here or a low spreading balsam branch there, looking, always looking as she moved along. She spied a vase-shaped yellow cap and stooped for a look. Chanterelle, she was pleased to see, and not the poisonous jack-o'-lantern. Most folks savored the smooth yellow chanterelle mushroom for its nut-like flavor. She hooked the stem with a finger and plucked it up. Before sticking the prize in her sack, she ran her thumb over the feather-like gills just for the pleasure of the soft feel. The mountain she searched for her mushrooms was only a small mountain compared to the others jutting up all around, and but for nesting cliff, reassuringly round with trails, a few made by man, but most made by animal, crisscrossing the gentle wooded slopes. It was the kind of woods her aging muscles and increasingly aching bones favored. It was said a person could see the ocean far off to the south from many of the taller mountains. She'd often heard it to be an inspiring sight. Many people went up there once every year or two just to view the splendor of the Creator by what he'd wrought. Some of those trails took a person along the scruffy edges of cliffs and scree and such. Some folk even tended herds of goats up on those steep and rocky slopes. But for a journey when she was a small child, when her pa, rest his soul, took them off to Fairfield, for what she could no longer remember, she had never been up there. Roberta was content to remain near the alluvial land. Unlike a lot of other folk, Roberta never climbed the higher mountains. She was afraid of high places. Up higher yet in the highlands above were far worse places, like the wasteland up above where the warfer birds nested. There was nothing in that desolate place, not a blade of grass nor a sprig of scrub brush, except those paca plants growing in that poison swampy water. Nothing else up there but the vast stretches of dark rocky sandy soil and a few bleached bones, as she heard tell. Like another world, those who'd seen it said silent but for the wind that dragged the dark sandy dirt into mounds that shifted over time, always moving on as if they were looking for something but never finding it. The lower mountains, like the ones she hunted for mushrooms, were beautiful lush places, rounder and softer mostly, and except for nesting cliff, not so steep and rocky. She liked it where it was full of trees and critters and growing things of all sorts. The deer trails she searched stayed away from the edges she didn't like, and never went very close to Nesting Cliff, as it was called because the falcons liked to nest there. She liked the deep woods where her mushrooms grew. Roberta collected mushrooms to sell at market, some fresh, some dried, some pickled, and others fixed in various ways. Most folk called her the Mushroom Lady, and knew her by no other name. Sold at market, the mushrooms helped earn her family some trading money for the things that made life easier. Needles and thread, some ready-made cloth, buckles and buttons, a lamp, oil, salt, sugar, cinnamon, nuts, things to help a body have an easier time of it. Easier for her family, and especially for her four grandchildren still living. Roberta's mushrooms provided all those things to supplement what they grew or raised themselves. Of course, they made good eating, too. She did like best the mushrooms that grew in the forests up on the mountain rather than those down in the valley. Touched as they were up there by clouds so much of the time, the mushrooms grew well in the damp conditions. She always thought there were none better than those from up on the mountain, and many folks sought her out just for her mountain mushrooms. Roberta had her secret places, too, where she found the best ones every year. 
The big pockets in her apron were plump and full with them, as was the sack over her shoulder. Because it was still early in the year, she'd mostly found heavy clusters of the tawny colored oyster mushrooms. Their fleshy tender caps were best for dipping in egg and frying, so she'd sell them fresh. But she'd been lucky and would be setting out chanterelles to dry as well as offering fresh. She found a goodly number of pheasants backs too, and they'd be best pickled if she wanted to get the highest price. It was too early for woolly velvet in most places, even though it would be common enough later on in the summer. But she'd gone to one of her special spots where there were a lot of pine stumps and she'd found some of the ochre-colored woolly velvet used to make dye. Roberta had even found a rotting birch with a cluster of smoky brown polypores. The kidney-shaped mushrooms were favored by cooks to keep a fire blazing and by men to strop their razors. Leaning on her walking stick, Roberta bent over a harmless-looking brownish mushroom. It had a ring on the off-white stalk. She saw that the yellowish gills were just starting to turn a rust color. It was that time of year for this mushroom, too. Grunting her displeasure, she let the deadly gallerina be and moved on. Back under the spreading limbs of an oak, as big around as her two oxen shoulder to shoulder when they were yoked up, she plucked up three good-sized spicy chanterelles. The spicy variety grew almost exclusively under oak wood. They had already turned from yellow to orange, so they'd be choice eating. Roberta knew where she was, but was off her usual path, so she'd never seen the huge oak before. When she'd seen the trees crown, she knew that with all the shade it provided, it would be a good spot for mushrooms. She was not disappointed. At the base of the oak, around part of the trunk where it came up from the ground, she was delighted to see a bunch of small pipes, or beef vein, as some folk called them, because the standing tubes were sometimes a vivid red, like a whole passel of veins bunched together and cut off even-like. These, though, were pinkish, streaked with just a bit of red. Roberta preferred the name Small Pipes, but she still didn't hold much favor with them. Some folk, though, bought them for their tart taste, and they were on the rare side, so they brought a decent price. Under the tree in the deep shade was a ring of spirit bells, so-called because of their bell-like tops. They weren't poisonous, but because of the bitter taste and woody texture, no one liked them. Worse, though, people thought that anyone stepping inside the ring would be bewitched, so folks generally didn't even want to see the lovely little spirit bells. Roberta had been walking through spirit bell rings since she was a toddler when her mother would take her along mushrooming. Since she held no favor with such superstition about her beloved mushrooms, she stepped through the ring of spirit bells, imagining she heard their delicate chimes and gathered up the small pipes. One of the spreading branches of the oak grew down low enough to make a seat. Big around as her ample waist, it was comfortable enough and dry enough for a good sit. Roberta slipped her sack to the ground. She sighed with relief as she laid her weary bones back against another branch, which turned up at just the right angle to rest her shoulders and head against. The tree seemed to cup her in its sheltering hand. Daydreaming as she was, she thought it was part of the dream when she heard a whisper that sounded like her name. It was a pleasing, low, warm sound, more a feeling of good things and pleasant thoughts than a word. The second time she knew it wasn't part of her daydream, and she was sure it was her name being spoken, but in a fashion somehow more intimate than a mere spoken word. The thing was, the way it was spoken strummed the strings of her heart. Like the spirit's own music it was, all lovely with kindness, compassion, and warmth. It made her sigh. It made her happy. It fell across her like warm sunlight on a chill day. The third time she sat up to look, longing to see the source of such a touching voice. Even as she moved, she felt like she was in one of her daydreams, all peaceful and content. The forest all about seemed to sparkle in the morning sun, seemed to glow. Roberta let out a small gasp, when she saw him not far away. She'd never seen him before, but she'd always known him, it seemed. She realized he was a familiar friend, a comfort, a partner from her mind since youth, though she never really gave it much thought before. He was the one who had always been there with her, it seemed, the one she always thought about when she was daydreaming, the face without definition, yet one she knew well. 
Now she realized he was as real as she had always imagined when she kissed him in her fancies, which she had done ever since she was young enough to know that a kiss was something more than your mother gave you before bed. His were kisses given in bed, all warm and ardent. She'd never thought he was real, but now she was sure she'd always known he was. As he stood there gazing into her eyes, how could he not be real? His tumble of hair swept back from his glorious face, showing his warm smile, though she thought it puzzling that she couldn't say just what he looked like. Yet at the same time, she knew his face as well as she knew hers. And she knew his every thought, just as he knew every thought and longing of hers. He was her soul's true mate. She knew his thoughts. She didn't need his name. That she didn't know his name was only proof to her that they were connected on a spiritual level that transcended words. And now he had stepped out of the mist of that spiritual world, needing to be with her just as she needed to be with him. He held his perfect hand out to her. His smile was knowing and loving and kind. He understood her, understood things about her that no one else could ever understand. It made her weep with joy that he understood her so understood her soul. His hand opened to her, calling her with his need. Roberta reached for his hand, her heart calling out her need of him. She seemed almost to float above the ground. Her feet touched like dandelion fluff drifting on a breath. Her body floated like weed in water as she stretched out to him, stretched out for his embrace. The closer she got, the warmer she felt. Not warm as if from the sun on her face, but warm like a child's arms around her neck. Warm like her mother's arms around her, like a lover's smile, like a lover's sweet kiss. Her whole life came down to this, to needing to be in his arms, feeling his tender embrace. Needing to whisper her yearning because she knew he would understand. Needing the breath from his lips on her ear, telling her he understood. She burned to whisper her love, to have him whisper his. She needed nothing in life so much as she needed to be in those arms she knew so well. Her muscles were no longer weary. Her bones no longer ached. She was no longer old. The years had slipped away from her like clothes slipping from lovers shedding encumbrances in order to get down to the bare essence of their being. Because of him, because of him alone, she was again in the winsome bloom of youth where everything was possible. His arm floated out to her, his need for her as great as hers for him. She stretched for his hand, but it seemed farther away, and she stretched more, but it was more distant still. Panic raced through her as she feared he would be gone before she could at last touch him. She felt as if she were swimming in honey and could make no progress. Her whole life she had longed to touch him. Her whole life she had longed to tell him. Her whole life she had longed to have her soul join with his. But now he was drifting from her. Roberta, her legs heavy like lead, leaped through the spring sunshine, through the sweet air, racing to her lover's arms. And yet he was farther still. Both his arms lifted to her. She could feel his need. She ached to comfort him, to shelter him from hurt, to soothe his strife. He could feel those longings in her and cried out her name that she might be strengthened in her effort to reach him. The sound of her name on his lips made her heart lift with joy, lift with a terrible pang of need to return such passion as he put into her name. She wept to know his name now, that she might put it to her undying love. With all her might she stretched out to him. She put her entire being into a reckless lunge for him, forsaking all care but her fierce need to reach him. Roberta cried her nameless love, cried her need as she reached for his fingers. His arms spread to take her into his loving embrace. As she rushed into those arms, the sun sparkled all about. The warm wind lifted her hair, ruffled her dress. As he cried her name with such beauty it made her ache, her arms spread wide to take him at last into her embrace. She felt as if she were floating endlessly through the air toward him, the sun on her face, the breeze in her hair. But it was all right because now she was where she wanted to be with him. At that moment, there was no more perfect time in the whole of her life, no more perfect feeling in the whole of her existence, no more perfect love in the whole of the world. 
she heard the perfect chimes of those feelings ring out with the glory of it all. Her heart nearly burst as she at last plunged into his embrace in one wild rush, screaming out her need, her love, her completion, wanting only to know his name so she might give everything of herself to him. His glowing smile was for her and her alone. His lips were for her and her alone. She closed that last bit of space toward him, longing to at last kiss the love of her life, the mate to her soul, the one and the only true passion in all of life. His lips were there at last, as she fell into his outstretched arms, into his embrace, into his perfect kiss. In that flawless instant, when her lips were just touching his, she saw through him, just beyond him, the merciless, unyielding valley floor hurtling up toward her, and she knew at last his name, Death. Chapter 26 There, Richard said, leaning close so Kalin could sight down his arm as he pointed off toward the horizon. See that really dark fleck of cloud in front of the lighter part? He waited for her nod. Under that, and just a bit to the right, Standing amid a seemingly endless sea of nearly waist-high grass, Kalin straightened and held a hand to her brow to shield her eyes from the morning light. I still can't see him, her frustration came out as a sigh. But I've never been able to see distant things as well as you. I don't see him either, Kara said. Richard again checked over his shoulder, scanning the empty grassland all around to make sure they weren't about to be surprised by someone sneaking up while they watched the approach of this one man. He saw no other threat. You will soon enough. He reached over to check that his sword was clear in its scabbard, only realizing he was doing so when he found the sword absent from his left hip. He instead pulled his bow from his shoulder and knocked an arrow. There had been countless times he had wished to be rid of the Sword of Truth and its attendant magic, inasmuch as it brought forth from within himself things he abhorred. The sword's magic could fuse with those feelings into a lethal wrath. Zed, when he first gave Richard the sword, told him it was only a tool. Over time he had come to comprehend Zed's advice. Still, it was a horrifying tool to have to use. It was up to the one wielding the sword to govern not simply the weapon, but himself. Understanding that part of it, among other things, was essential to using the weapon as it was intended. And it was intended for none but a true seeker of truth. Richard shuddered to think of that contrivance of magic in the wrong hands. He thanked the good spirits that, if he couldn't have it with him, it was at least safe. Below distant billowing clouds, their interiors glowing in the morning light colors from a deep yellow to an unsettling violet that marked the violence of the storms contained within, the man continued to approach. Lightning, silent at this distance, flashed and flickered inside the colossal clouds, illuminating hidden canyons, valley walls, and seething peaks. Compared with other places he had been, the sky and clouds above the flat plain somehow appeared impossibly grand. He guessed it was because from horizon to horizon there was nothing, no mountains, no trees, nothing to interrupt the drama of the vast vault of stage overhead. The departing storm clouds had only finally moved on eastward before dawn, taking with them the rain that had so vexed them when with the mud people, their first day of traveling, and their first miserable cold night without a fire. Traveling in the rain was unpleasant. In its wake, the rain had left the three of them irritable. Like him, Kalin was worried about Zed and Anne and troubled by what the lurk might bring next. It was also frustrating to have to undertake a long journey when they were in such a rush and it was so vitally important rather than return to aid and drill in short order through the sliff. Richard was almost willing to take the risk. Almost. With Kara, though, it seemed something more was disturbing her. She was as disagreeable as a cat in a sack. He wasn't eager to reach in and get scratched. He figured that if it was truly important, she would tell them. Added to all that, Richard was unsettled by not having his sword with him when there was trouble about. He feared the lurk trying to harm Kalin while he was unable to protect her. Even without the trouble caused by the Sisters of the Dark, there were any number of ordinary dangers for a confessor. Any number of people who would, were she defenseless, like to settle what they viewed as injustices. 
With the spell eroding magic, sooner or later her confessor's power would be gone, and she would be without its ability to protect her. He needed to be able to protect her, but without the sword he feared being inadequate to the task. Every time he reached for his sword, and it wasn't there, he felt an emptiness he couldn't express in words. It was as if part of him was missing. Even so, Richard was, for some reason, uneasy about going to Aiden Drill. Something about it felt wrong. He rationalized it as worry about leaving Zed when he was so weak and vulnerable. But Zed had made it clear there was no choice. Up until he had spotted the approaching stranger, their second day had been looking sunny, dry, and more agreeable. Richard put some tension to the bowstring. After their encounter with the chicken thing, or rather the lurk, and with so much at stake, he didn't intend to let anyone get close unless he knew them to be a friend. Richard frowned over at Kalen. You know, I think my mother once told me a story or something about a cat named Lurk. Holding a fistful of hair to keep the breeze from blowing it across her face, Kalen frowned back. That's odd. Are you sure? No. She died when I was young. It's hard to remember if I'm really remembering or just fooling myself into thinking I am. What do you think you remember? Kalen asked. Richard stretched the bowstring to test it and then relaxed it part way. I think I fell down and skinned a knee or something and she was trying to make me laugh you know, to make me forget my hurt. I think she just that one time told me how when she was little, her mother told her a story of a cat that lurked about pouncing on things and so earned the name Lurk. I'd swear I remember her laughing and asking if I didn't think that was a funny name. Yes, very funny, Kara said, making clear she thought it wasn't. With a finger, she lifted the point of his arrow and thus his bow in the direction of the danger she seemed to think he was ignoring. What made you think of that now, Kalen asked. Richard pointed with his chin toward the approaching man. I was considering a man being out here. You know, thinking of what other dangers might be lurking about. And when you thought of all these dangers lurking about, Kara said, did you also decide to just stand around and let them all come to attack you as they wish? Ignoring Kara, Richard tilted his head toward the man. You must see him now. No, I still don't see where it is you... Wait. Hand to her brow, Kaylin rose up onto her tiptoes, as if that would help her see better. There he is. I see him now. I think we should conceal ourselves in the grass and then pounce on him, Kara said. He saw us at the same time I saw him, Richard said. He knows we're here. We couldn't surprise him. At least there is only one, Kara yawned. We will have no trouble. Kara, standing the middle watch, hadn't wakened him as early as she was supposed to for his turn at watch. She had left him sleeping an extra hour at least. Middle watch, too, usually got less sleep. Richard checked over his shoulder again. You may see only one, but there are a number more. A dozen at least. Kaylin put her hand back to her forehead to shield her eyes. I don't see any more. She looked to the sides and behind. I only see the one. Are you sure? Yes. When I first saw him and he saw me, he left the others and came alone toward us. They still wait. Kara snatched up a pack. She shoved Kaylin's shoulder, then Richard's. Let's go. We can outdistance them until we're out of sight and then hide. If they follow, we will take them by surprise and put a quick end to the pursuit. Richard returned the shove. Would you just settle down? He's coming alone so as not to draw any arrows. If it was an attack, he would have brought all his men at once. We will wait. Kara folded her arms and pressed her lips together in a bit of ire. She seemed to be beyond her usual protective self. Whether or not she was ready to tell him, they were going to have to talk to her and find out what her problem was. Maybe Kaylin would have some luck. The man lifted his arms, waving at them in a friendly gesture. Suddenly recognizing the man, Richard took his hand from the bowstring and returned the greeting. It's Chandelin. It wasn't long until Kaylin waved her arm, too. You're right, it is Chandelin. Richard returned his arrow to the quiver hung on his belt. I wonder what he's doing out here. When you were still searching the chickens gathered together in the buildings, Kaylin said, he went to check on some of his men on far patrol. He said they had encountered some heavily armed people. His men were worried about the behavior of the strangers. They were hostile? No, 
Kaylin pushed her damp hair back over her shoulder. But Chandelin's men said they had a calm about them when approached. That troubled him. Richard nodded as he watched Chandelin's approach, seeing that he brought no weapons except a belt knife. As was the custom, he didn't smile as he trotted up to them. Until proper greetings were exchanged, mud people didn't usually smile when they encountered even friends on the plains. With a grim expression, Chandelin quickly slapped Richard, Kalen, and Kara. Though he had run most of the way, he seemed hardly winded as he greeted them by their titles. Strength to the Mother Confessor. Strength to Richard with the temper. He added a nod to his spoken greeting of Kara. She was a protector, the same as he. All three returned the slap and wished him their strength. Where are you going? Chandelin asked. There's trouble, Richard said as he offered his water skin. We have to get back to Aidendrill. Chandelin accepted the water skin as he let out a grumble of worry. The chicken that is not a chicken? In a way, yes, Kalin told him. It turns out it was magic conjured by the Sisters of the Dark Jagang is holding prisoner. Lord Rall used his magic to destroy the chicken that was not a chicken, Kara put in. Chandelin, looking relieved to hear her news, took a swig of water. Then why must you go to Aidendrill? Richard rested the end of his bow on the ground and gripped the other end. The spell the sisters cast endangers everyone and everything of magic. It's making Zed and Anne weak. They're waiting back at your village. In Aidendrill, we hope to unleash magic to counter the sisters of the dark, and then Zed will be strong enough to put everything right again. The sister's magic made the chicken thing that killed Junie. Until we can get to Aidendrill, no one is safe. Having listened carefully, Chandelin finally replaced the stopper and handed back the water skin. Then you must soon be on your way to do what only you can. He checked over his shoulder. Now that Chandelin had identified himself, the others were approaching. But my men have met strangers who must see you first. Richard hooked his bow back over his shoulder as he peered off into the distance. He couldn't make out the people. So who are they? Chandelin stole a glance at Kalin before directing his answer to Richard. We have an old saying. It is best to hold your tongue around the cook, or you may end up in the pot with the chicken that ate her dinner greens. It seemed to Richard that Chandelin was trying very hard to keep from looking at Kalin's puzzled expression. Although Richard couldn't fathom the reason, he thought he understood the figure of speech, odd as it was. He thought maybe it was a bad translation. The approaching people weren't far off. Chandelin, having had one of his trusted hunters killed by the lurk, would want Richard and Kalin to do what they could to stop the enemy. He would not insist they delay their journey unless he had a good reason. If it's important for them to see us, then let's go. Chandelin caught Richard's arm. They only ask to see you. Perhaps you wish to go alone? Then you could be on your way. Why would Richard want to go alone, Kaylin asked, suspicion bubbling up in her voice. She then added something in the mud people's language which Richard didn't understand. Chandelin lifted his hands, showing her his empty palms, as if to say he held no weapon and wished no fight. For some reason he seemed to want no part of whatever was going on. Maybe I should... Richard closed his mouth when Kalin's suspicious glower shifted to him. He cleared his throat. I was going to say we have no secrets. Richard hefted his gear. Kalin is always welcome at my side. We have no time to waste. Let's go. Chandelin nodded and turned to lead them to their fate. Richard thought he saw the man roll his eyes in a don't-say-I-didn't-warn-you fashion. Richard could see ten of Chandelin's hunters following behind the seven oncoming travelers, with another three hunters winged out distantly to each side, hemming in the strangers without being overtly threatening. The mud people hunters seemed merely to accompany and guide the strangers, but Richard knew they were ready to strike at any sign of hostility. Armed outsiders on mud people land were like tinder before a lightning storm. Richard hoped this storm, too, would move away and leave sunny skies to follow. Kalin, Kara, and Richard hurried behind Chandelin through the wet new grass. Chandelin's men were the first line of defense for the mud people. That the mud people's land was given a wide berth by almost everyone spoke to their fighting ferocity. 
Yet Chandalin's skilled and deadly hunters, now turned escorts, elicited no more than detached indifference from the six men in loose flaxen clothes. Something about that indifference at being surrounded tickled at Richard's memory. As the approaching group got close enough for Richard to suddenly recognize them, he missed a step. It took a few moments of scrutiny before he could believe what he was seeing. He at last understood the stranger's fearless indifference to Chandalin's men. He couldn't imagine what these people were doing away from their own homeland. Each man was dressed the same and carried the same weapons. Richard knew only one by name, but knew them all. These people were dedicated to a purpose laid down by their lawgivers thousands of years before, those wizards in the Great War who had taken their homeland and created the Valley of the Lost to separate the new world from the old. Their black-handled swords with their distinctive curved blades that widened toward clipped points remained in their scabbards. One end of a cord was tied to a ring on the pommel of each man's sword. The other end of the cord looped around the swordsman's neck as a precaution against losing the weapon in battle. Additionally, each of the six carried spears and a small, round, unadorned shield. Richard had seen women clothed and armed the same and committed to the same purpose, but this time they were all men. For these men, practice with their swords was an art form. They practiced that art by moonlight, after the day did not provide them all the time they wished. Using their swords was near to a religious devotion, and they went about their blade work with pious commitment. These men were blade masters. The seventh, the woman, was dressed differently and not armed, at least not in the conventional sense. Richard wasn't good at judging such things by sight, but a quick calculation told him she had to be at least six months pregnant. A thick mass of long black hair framed a lovely face. Her presence giving her features, especially her dark eyes, a certain edginess. Unlike the men's loose outfits of simple cloth, she wore a knee-length dress of finely woven flax, dyed a rich earth color, and gathered at the waist with a buckskin belt. The ends of the belt were decorated with roughly cut gemstones. Up the outside of each arm and across the shoulders of the dress was a row of little strips of different colored cloth. Each was knotted on through a small hole beneath a corded band, and each, Richard knew, would have been tied on by a supplicant. It was a prayer dress. Each of the little colored strips, when they fluttered in the breeze, meant to send a prayer to the good spirits. The dress was worn only by their spirit woman. Richard's mind raced with possibilities as to why these people would have traveled so far from their homeland. He could come up with nothing good and a lot that was unpleasant. Richard had halted. Kalin waited to his left, Kara to his right, and Chandalin to the right of her. Ignoring everyone else, the men in the loose clothes all laid their spears on the ground beside themselves as they went to their knees before Richard. They bowed forward, touching their foreheads to the ground, and stayed there. The woman stood silently regarding him. Her dark eyes bore the timeless look Richard had often seen in others, Sister Verna, Shota the witch woman, Anne, and Kalin among others. That timeless look was the mark of the gift. As she gazed into Richard's eyes with a look that seemed to hint at wisdom he would never grasp, a ghost of a smile touched her lips. Without a word, she went to her knees at the head of the six men accompanying her. She touched her forehead to the ground and then kissed the toe of his boot. Kaharin, she whispered reverently. Richard reached down and tugged on the shoulder of her dress, urging her up. Du Shailu, it pleases my heart to see you are well, but what are you doing here? She rose up before him, a heartening, handsome smile widening across her face. She bent forward and kissed his cheek. I have come to see you, of course. Richard, seeker, Kaharin, husband. Chapter 27 Husband? Richard heard Kalin say in a rising tone of concern. With a jolt of astonished shock that nearly took him from his feet, and did take his breath, Richard abruptly recalled Du Shailu's account of her people's old law. The dire implications staggered him. At the time, he had dismissed her adamant assertions as either irrational conviction or perhaps misconceptions about their history. Now, this old ghost had unexpectedly returned to haunt him. Husband, Kalin repeated, a little louder, 
a little more insistently. Her dark eyes turned to Kalen, as if annoyed she had to take them from Richard. Yes, husband, I am Dushailu, wife of the Kaharan, Richard, the seeker. Dushailu rubbed her hand over her pronounced belly. Her look of annoyance passed, and she beamed with pride. I bear his child. Leave it to me, mother confessor, Kara said. There was no mistaking the resolute menace in her voice. This time I will take care of it. Kara yanked the knife from Chandelin's belt and lunged for the woman. Richard was quicker. He spun to Kara and shoved the tips of his stiffened fingers against her upper chest. It not only halted her forward progress, but drove her back three paces. He had enough problems without her causing more. He shoved her again and drove her back another three, and then another three, away from the group of people. Richard twisted the knife from her grip. Now you listen to me. You don't know the first thing about this woman. I know you know nothing. Listen to me. You are fighting the last war. This is not Nadine. This is nothing like Nadine. His quiescent fury had at last erupted. With a cry of unleashed rage, Richard heaved the knife at the ground. The force drove it beneath the grass mat, burying it completely into the soil of the plains. Kalin laid her hand on the back of his shoulder. Richard, calm down. What's this about? What's going on? Richard raked his fingers back through his hair. Clenching his jaw, he glanced about and saw the men still on their knees. Gian, the rest of you, get off your knees, get up. The men rose up at once. Du Shailu waited passively, patiently. Chandelin and his men backed off. The mud people had named him Richard with the temper, and while not surprised, looked to think it best to give ground. Chandelin and his men had no idea his anger was for what had killed one of them, had most likely he realized killed two of them, and would surely kill more. Kalin regarded him with a look of concern. Richard, calm down and get a hold of yourself. Who are these people? He couldn't seem to slow his breathing, or his heart or unclench his fists, or stop his racing thoughts. Everything seemed to be reeling out of control. Fears laid to rest seemed to have unshackled themselves and suddenly sprung up to snare him. He should have seen it before. He cursed himself for missing it. But there had to be a way to stop it. He had to think. He had to stop fearing things that had not yet happened and think of a way to prevent them from coming to be. He realized it had already happened. He now had to think of the solution. Kalin lifted his chin to look into his eyes. Richard, answer me. Who are these people? He pressed a hand to his forehead in frustrated rage. The Bakaban Mana. It means those without masters. We now have a Kaharin. We are no longer the Bakaban Mana, Dushailu said from not far away. We are now the Bakatau Mana. Not really comprehending Dushailu's explanation, Kaylin turned her attention once more to Richard. This time, her voice had a razor's edge to it. Why is she saying you are her husband? His mind had already galloped so far off down another road, he had to concentrate for a moment to understand what Kaylin was asking. She didn't realize the implications. To Richard, Kaylin's question seemed insignificant past history in the face of the future looming before them. He impatiently tried to wave away her concern. Kaylin, it's not what you think. She licked her lips and took a breath. Fine, her green eyes fixed on him. So why don't you just explain it to me then? It was not a question. Richard instead asked his own. Don't you see? Overwhelmed by impatience, he pointed at Du Shailu. It's the old law. By the old law, she is my wife. At least she thinks she is. Richard pressed his fingertips to his temples. His head was throbbing. We are in a great deal of trouble, he muttered. You are, anyway, Kara said. Kara, Kalin said through her teeth, that's enough. She turned back to him. Richard, what are you talking about? What's going on? Accounts from Kolo's journal echoed through his mind. He couldn't seem to order his thoughts enough to put all the tumbling elements into words. The world was shredding apart, and she was asking him yesterday's questions. Since he saw it so clearly looming before them, he couldn't comprehend why Kalin wouldn't comprehend the danger, too. Don't you see? Richard's mind picked madly through the shadowy possibilities as he tried to decide what to do next. Time was slipping away. He didn't even know how much they had. 
I see you got her pregnant, Kara said. Richard turned a glare on the moored Sith. After all we have been through, Kara, do you think no more of me? Looking galled, Kara folded her arms and didn't answer. Do the math, Kalen told Kara. Richard would have been a prisoner of the moored Sith, far off at the People's Palace in Dahara, back when this woman got pregnant. Unlike the Aegeal Richard wore out of respect for the two women who had died protecting them, Kalen wore the Aegeal of Denna, the moored Sith who had, at the behest of Dark and Rall, captured Richard and tortured him nearly to death. Denna had decided to take Richard as her mate, but she had never once implied it was marriage. To Denna, it was just another way to torture and humiliate him. In the end, Richard forgave Denna for what she had done to him. Denna, knowing he was going to kill her in order to escape, gave him her Aegeal and asked him to remember her as having been more in life than simply moored Sith. She had asked him to share her last breath of life. It had been through Denna that Richard had come to understand and empathize with these women, and by so doing he had been the only one ever to have escaped a moored Sith. Richard was surprised at Kalin already having done the math. He would not have expected her to doubt him. He was wrong. She seemed to read his thoughts in his eyes. It's just something you do without thinking, she whispered. All right? Richard, please, tell me what's going on. You're a confessor. You know how different arrangements can constitute marriage to different peoples. Except for you, confessors always picked their mates for reasons of their own, reasons other than love, and then took them with their power before wedding them. The man had no say. The man a confessor singled out to be her husband was selected for little more reason than his value as breeding stock. Since her power would destroy the man she picked, love, despite what she might wish, had never been an option for a confessor. A confessor chose a man for the qualities he would contribute to her daughter. Where I came from, Richard went on, parents often chose who their children would wed, a father would one day tell his child, this will be your husband or this will be your wife. Different people have different ways and different laws. Kalin cast a furtive glance at Du Shailu, her gaze pausing twice, once on Du Shailu's face and once on her belly. When Kalin's gaze returned to him, her eyes had turned brutally cold. So tell me about her laws. Richard didn't think Kaylin was aware that she was stroking the dark stone on the delicate gold necklace Shota had given her. The witch woman had appeared unexpectedly at their wedding, and Richard remembered well her words to them. This is my gift to you both. I do this out of love for you both and for everyone else. As long as you wear it, you will bear no children. Celebrate your union and your love. You have each other now, as you always wanted. Mark my words well, never take this off when you are together. I will not allow a male child of this union to live. I do not make a threat, I deliver you a promise. Disregard my request and suffer the consequences of my vow. The witch woman had then looked into Richard's eyes and said, Better you battle the keeper of the underworld himself than me. Shota's elaborate throne was covered with the hide of an experienced wizard who had crossed her. Richard knew little of his birthright of the gift. He didn't necessarily believe Shota's claim that their child would be a fiend unleashed upon the world, but for now he and Kalin had decided to heed the witch woman's warning. They had little choice. Kalin's fingers on his cheek drew his gaze to hers and reminded him she wanted an answer. Richard made an effort to slow his words. Du Shai Lu is from the old world, on the other side of the Valley of the Lost. I helped her when Sister Verna took me across to the Old World. These other people, the Majendi, had captured Du Shailu and were going to sacrifice her. They held her prisoner for months. The men used her for their amusement. The Majendi expected me, being gifted, to help them sacrifice her in return for passage through their land. A gifted man helping with the sacrifice was part of their religious beliefs. Instead, I freed Du Shailu hoping she would see us through her trackless swamps since we could no longer cross the Majendi's land. I provided men to guide Richard and the witch safely through the swamps to the big stone witch house, Du Shailu said, as if that would clarify matters. Kalin blinked at the explanation. Witch? Witch house? She means Sister Verna and the Palace of the Prophets, Richard said. 
They led Sister Verna and me there, not because I freed Du Shailu, but because I fulfilled an ancient prophecy. Du Shailu stepped to Richard's side, as if by right. According to the old law, Richard came to us and danced with the spirits, proving he is the Kaharin and my husband. Richard could almost see Kalin's hackles lifting. What does that mean? Richard opened his mouth as he searched for the words. Du Shailu lifted her chin and spoke instead. I am the spirit woman of the Bakatao Mana. I am also the keeper of our laws. It is proclaimed that the Kaharin will announce his arrival by dancing with the spirits and spilling the blood of thirty Bakaban Mana, a feat none but the chosen one could accomplish, and only then with the aid of the spirits. It is said that when this happens we are no longer a free people, but bound to his wishes. We are his to rule. It was for this our blade masters trained their entire lives. They had the honor of teaching the Kaharin so that he might fight the dark spirit. This proved Richard was the Kaharin, come to return us to our land, as the old ones promised. A light breeze ruffled Du Shailu's thick hair. Her dark eyes revealed no emotion, but the slightest break in her voice betrayed it. He killed the thirty, as set down in the old law. The thirty are now legend to our people. I didn't have any choice. Richard could manage little more than a whisper. They would have killed me otherwise. I begged them to stop. I begged Du Shailu to stop them. I didn't save her life just to end up killing those people. In the end, I defended myself. Kaelin gave Du Shailu a long, hard look before returning to Richard. She was held prisoner, and you saved her life and then returned her to her people. Richard nodded. And she then had her people try to kill you? That was her thanks? There was more to it. Richard felt uncomfortable defending those people's actions, actions that had resulted in so much bloodshed. He could still remember the sickening stench of it. Kalin stole another icy sidelong glance at Du Shailu. But you saved her life? Yes. So tell me what more there is to it, then. Through the pain of the memories, Richard sought to explain in words Kalin would understand. What they did was a kind of test, a live-or-die test. It forced me to learn to use the magic of the sword in a way I never before realized was possible. In order to survive, I had to draw on the experience of the people who had used the sword before me. What do you mean? How could you draw on their experience? The magic of the sword of truth retains the essence of the fighting knowledge of all those who've used the sword before, both the good and the wicked. I figured out how to tap that skill by letting the spirits of the sword speak to me, in my mind. But in the heat of combat, there isn't always time for me to comprehend it in words. So sometimes the information I need comes to me in images, symbols that relate it. That was a pivotal connection in understanding why I was named in prophecy Fuer Grisa Ostralka, the bringer of death. Richard touched the amulet on his chest. The ruby represented a drop of blood. The lines around it were a symbolic portrayal of the dance. It held meaning for a war wizard. This, Richard whispered, this is the dance with death. But back then, with Du Shailu and her thirty, that was when I first understood. Prophecy said I would someday come to them. Prophecy and their old laws said they had to teach me this, to dance with the spirits of those who had used the sword before. I doubt they fully understood how their test would do this, just that they were to uphold their duty, and if they did and I was the one, I would survive. I needed that knowledge to stand against Dark and Rawl and send him back to the underworld. Remember how I called him in the gathering with the mud people, and how he escaped into this world and then the sisters took me? Of course, Kalin said. So they forced you into a life or death fight against impossible odds in order to make you call upon your inner strength, your gift. And as a result, you killed her thirty blade masters? Yes, exactly. They were fulfilling prophecy. He shared a long look with his only true wife, in his heart anyway. You know how terrible prophecy can be. Kaelin looked away at last and nodded, caught in her own painful memories. Prophecies had caused them many hardships and subjected them to many trials. His second wife, Nadine, forced upon him by prophecy, had been one of those trials. Du Shailu's chin lifted. Five of those the Kaharin killed were my husbands and the fathers to my children. Her five husbands? Dear spirits. Richard shot Du Shailu a look. 
You're not helping. You mean by her law, killing her husbands compels you to become her husband? No. It's not because I killed her husbands, but because defeating the Thirty proved I was their Kaharin. Du Shai Lu is their spirit woman. By their old laws, the spirit woman is meant to be the wife of the Kaharin. I should have thought of it before. That's obvious, Kalin snapped. Look, I know how it must sound. I know it doesn't seem to make any sense. No, it's all right, I understand. Her chill expression heated to simmering hurt. So you did the noble thing and married her, of course. Makes perfect sense to me. She leaned close. And you just got so busy and all, you forgot to mention it before you married me. Of course, I understand. Who wouldn't? A man can't be expected to recall all the wives he leaves lying about. She folded her arms and turned away. Richard, how could you... No, it wasn't like that. I never agreed. Never. There was no ceremony. No one said any words. I never stood and swore an oath. Don't you understand? We weren't married. It never happened. So much has been going on. I'm sorry I forgot to tell you, but it never entered my mind because at the time I dismissed it as an irrational belief of an isolated people. I didn't put any stock in it. She simply thinks that since I killed those men to defend myself, that makes me her husband. It does, Du Shailu said. Kalin glanced briefly at Du Shailu as she coolly considered his words. So then you never, in any sense, really agreed to marry her? Richard threw up his hands. That's what I've been trying to tell you. It's just the Baka Ban Mana's beliefs. Baka Tau Mana, Du Shailu corrected. Richard ignored her and leaned close to Kalin. I'm sorry, but can we talk about it later? We may have a serious problem. She lifted an eyebrow. He amended to another serious problem. She gave him an indulgent scowl. He turned away, pulling a stalk of grass as he considered the plausibility of worse trouble than Kalin's ire. You know a lot about magic. I mean, you grew up in Adendril with wizards who instructed you, and you've studied books at the wizard's keep. You're the mother confessor. I'm not gifted in the conventional sense, Kalin said. Not like a wizard or a sorceress. My power is different. But yes, I know about magic. Being a confessor, I had to be taught about magic in many of its various forms. Then answer me this. If there is a requirement for magic, can the requirement be fulfilled by some ambiguous rule without the actual required ritual taking place? Yes, of course. It's called the reflective effect. Reflective effect. How does that work? Kaylin wound a long lock of damp hair on a finger as she turned her mind to the question. Say you have a room with only one window, and therefore the sun never reaches the corner. Can you get the sunlight to shine into a corner it never touches? Since it's called the reflective effect, I'd guess you'd use a mirror to reflect the sunlight into the corner. Right. Kalin let the hair go and held up the finger. Even though the sunlight could never itself reach the corner, by using a mirror you can get the sunlight to fall where it ordinarily wouldn't. Magic can sometimes work like that. Magic is much more complex, of course, but that's the easiest way I can explain it. Even if only by some ancient law that completes a long-forgotten condition, the spell might reflect the condition to fulfill the arcane requirements of the magic involved. Like water seeking its own level, a spell will often seek its own solution within the laws of its nature. That's what I was afraid of, Richard murmured. He tapped the end of the stalk of grass flat between his teeth as he stared out at the lightning flickering ominously in the distant clouds. The magic involved dates from the time of that ancient mandate about the Kaharan, he said at last. Therein lies the problem. Kalin gripped his arm, turning him back to face her. But Zed said he lied to us. I fell for it. Exasperated, Richard flung the stalk of grass aside. Zed had used the wizard's first rule. People will believe a lie either because they want to believe it's true or because they fear it is, to mislead them. I wanted to believe him, Richard muttered. He tricked me. What are you talking about? Kara asked. Richard heaved a crestfallen sigh. He had been careless in more ways than one. Zed, he made all that up about the lurk. Kara made a face. Why would he do that? Because for some reason he didn't want us to know the chimes are loose. He couldn't believe how stupid he'd been, forgetting about Du Shailu. Kalin was right to be angry. When it came down to it, 
His excuse was pathetically inadequate. And he was supposed to be the Lord Rawl? People were supposed to believe in and follow him? Kaylin rubbed her fingertips across the furrows of her brow. Richard, let's think this through. It can't be... Zed said you would have to be my third wife in order to have called the chimes forth into this world. Among other things, Kaylin insisted. He said among other things. Wearily, Richard lifted a finger. Du Shailu, he lifted a second finger. Nadine, he lifted a third finger. You, you are my third wife, in principle anyway. I may not look at it that way, but the wizards who cast the spell wouldn't care how I may wish to look at it. They cast magic that would be set into motion by keying off a prescribed set of conditions. Kalin heaved a long-suffering sort of sigh. You're forgetting one important element. When I spoke aloud the names of the three chimes, we weren't yet married. I wasn't yet your second wife, much less your third. When I was forced to wed Nadine in order to gain entrance to the Temple of the Winds, and you were likewise forced to wed Driffin, in our hearts we said the words to each other. We were married then and there because of that vow, as far as the spirits were concerned anyway. Anne herself agreed it was so. As you have just explained, magic sometimes works by such ambiguous rules. No matter our feelings about it, the formal requirements, the requirements of some ancient magic conjured by wizards during the Great War when the prophecy about the Kaharan and the old law were set down, have been met. But, Richard gestured emphatically, Kalin, I'm sorry I foolishly didn't think, but we have to face it. The chimes are loose. Chapter 28 Despite how valid he thought his reasoning, it didn't at all look to Richard that Kaylin was convinced. She didn't even look amenable to reason. What she looked was angry. Did you tell Zed about her? Kaylin gestured heatedly at Du Shailu. Did you? You had to have said something to him. He could understand her feelings. He wouldn't like to discover she had another husband she had neglected to mention. No matter how innocent she might have been, even if it was as tenuous as was his connection with Du Shailu, Still, this was about something considerably more important than some convoluted condition that contrived to make Du Shailu his first wife. It was about something dangerous in the extreme. Kaylin had to understand that. She had to see that they were in a great deal of trouble. They had already wasted valuable time. He prayed to the good spirits that he could make her see the truth of what he was telling her without having to reveal to her the full extent of why he knew it to be true. I told you, Kaelin, I didn't even remember it until now because at the time I didn't consider it authentic, and so I didn't realize it could have any bearing on this. Besides, when would I have had time to tell him? Junie died before we had a chance to really talk to him, and then he made up that story about the lurk and sent us on this fool task. Then how did he know? In order to be tricking us, he would have had to know about it first. How did Zed know I am, in fact, your third wife? even if only by some, her fists tightened, some stupid old law you artfully forgot. Richard threw up his hands. If it's raining at night, you don't have to be able to see the clouds in the dark to know the rain has to be falling from the sky. If Zed knew the fact of something and knew it was trouble, he wouldn't worry about the how of it. He would worry about fixing the leak in the roof. She pinched the bridge of her nose as she took a breath. Richard, maybe he really believes what he told us about the lurk. Kalin cast a cool glance at his first wife. Maybe he believes it because it's true. Richard shook his head. Kalin, we have to face it. We make it worse if we ignore the truth and invest hope in a lie. People are already dying. Junie's death doesn't prove the chimes are really loose. It's not just Junie. The chimes' presence in this world caused that stillborn baby. What? In frustration, Kalin ran her fingers back into her hair. Richard could understand her wishing it to be the lurk and not the chimes, because unlike the chimes, they had a solution for the lurk. But wishing didn't make it so. First, you forget you already have another wife. Now you rush off down some road of fancy. Richard, how could you come to such a conclusion? Because the chimes being in this world somehow destroys magic. The mud people have magic. Though the mud people were a remote people living a simple life, they were unlike any others. Only they had the ability to call their ancestors' spirits in a gathering and talk to the dead. 
While they didn't think of themselves as having magic, only the mud people could call an ancestor from beyond that outer circle of the grace, bringing them across the boundary of the veil and into the inner circle of life, if only for a brief time. If the Imperial Order won the war, the mud people, among many others, would eventually all be slaughtered for possessing magic. With the chimes loose, they might not live long enough to face that possibility. Richard noticed Chandelin not far off listening intently. The mud people have the unique magical ability of the gathering. Each is born with this ability, this magic, that makes them all vulnerable to the chimes. Zed told us, and I also read it in Kolo's journal, that the weak are affected first. Richard's voice softened with sorrow. What could be weaker than an unborn child? Kaylin, touching the stone of her necklace, looked away from his eyes. She dropped her hand to her side and looked to be trying to veneer her ire with patient logic. I can still feel my power, just as always. As you said, if the chimes were loose, they would be causing the failure of magic. We have no proof that's happening. If it were true, don't you think I would know? Do you think me woefully inexperienced in knowing my own power? Richard, we can't leap to conclusions. Newborns die all the time. That is no proof magic is failing. Richard turned to Kara. She was standing not far off listening as she watched the grasslands, the mud people hunters, and in particular the Baka Taumana. Kara, how long has your Aegeal been useless? he asked. Kara quailed. She could hardly have looked more startled had he unexpectedly slapped her. She opened her mouth, but no words came. She lifted her chin, thinking better of admitting such defeat. Lord Rall, what makes you think... You pulled Chandelin's knife. I have never before seen you forsake your Aegeal in favor of another weapon. No Mord Sith would. How long, Kara? She wet her lips. Her eyes closed in defeat as she turned away. In the last few days, I have begun to have trouble sensing you. I don't feel any difference, except I have increasing difficulty sensing your location. At first, I thought it was nothing, but apparently the bond grows weaker by the day. The Aegeal is powered by the bond to our Lord Rall. When the Mord Sith were within a reasonable distance, they always knew precisely where he was by that bond. He imagined it had to be disorienting to suddenly lose that sense. Kara cleared her throat as she stared off at the distant storm clouds. Tears glistened in her blue eyes. The Aegeal is dead in my fingers. Only a moored Sith would anguish over the failure of magic that gave her pain every time she touched it. Such was the nature of these women and their unqualified commitment to duty. Kara looked back at him, the fire returning to her expression. But I am still sworn to you and will do what I must to protect you. This change is nothing for the Mord Sith. And the Daharan army, Richard whispered, as he considered the spreading extent of their troubles. The Daharan people were charged to purpose through their bond. Jagang is coming. Without the army. The bond was ancient magic he had inherited because he was a gifted Rall. That bond was created to be protection from the Dreamwalkers. Without it... Even if Kalin believed it was the lurk and not the chimes, Zed had told them that, too, would cause magic to fail. Richard knew Zed would have had to make whatever story he invented relate closely to reality in order to fool them. Either way, Kalin would understand the rotting fruits of the dying tree of magic. Her reassuring fingers found his arm. The army may not feel their bond like before, Richard, but they are bonded to you in other ways. Most in the Midlands follow the Mother Confessor, and they are not bonded to her by any magic. In the same way, soldiers follow you because they believe in you. You have proven yourself to them, and they to you. The Mother Confessor is right, Kara said. The army will remain loyal because you are their leader, their true leader. They believe in you, the same as I. Richard let out a long breath. I appreciate that, Kara, I really do, but... You are the Lord Rall. You are the magic against magic. We are the steel against steel. It will remain so. That's just it. I can't be the magic against magic. Even if it were the lurk instead of the chimes, magic won't work. Kara shrugged. Then you will figure a way for it to lurk. You are the Lord Rall. That is what you do. Richard, Kalen said. 
Zed told us the Sisters of the Dark conjured the Lurk, and that's what's causing magic to fail. You have no proof it's really the chimes instead. We have but to do as Zed has asked of us, and then he will be able to counter the Sisters' magic. As soon as we get to Adendril, everything will be back to right. Still, Richard could not bring himself to tell her. Kaelin, I wish it were as you say, but it isn't, he said simply. Her veneer of patience began cracking. Why do you insist it's the chimes when Zed told us it was the lurk? Richard leaned closer to her. Think about it. My grandmother, Zed's wife, apparently told her little girl, my mother, a story about a cat named Lurk. Just that one time she told me about a cat named Lurk, but Zed wouldn't know she did. It was a small thing my mother told me once when I was little, like a hundred other little words of comfort, or phrases, or stories to bring a smile. I never mentioned it to Zed. For some reason, Zed wanted to hide the truth. Lurk, because he once had a cat by that name, was probably just the first thing that came into his head. Admit it, doesn't the name Lurk strike you as a bit whimsical, once you think about it? Kaylin folded her arms across her breasts. She made a reluctant grimace. I thought I was the only one who thought so. She mustered her resolve. But that doesn't really prove it. It could be coincidence. Richard knew it was the chimes, in much the same way he could sense the chicken that wasn't a chicken, and had wished Kalin would believe him, he dearly wished she would trust him in this. What are these things, these chimes? Kara asked. Richard turned away from the others and stared off toward the horizon. He didn't know a lot about them, but what he did know made his hair want to stand on end. Those in the old world wanted to end magic, much as Jagang does today and probably for the same reason, so they could more easily rule by the sword. Those in the new world wanted magic to live on. In order to prevail, the wizards on both sides created weapons of inconceivable horror, desperately hoping they would bring the war to an end. Many of those weapons, the Mriswith, for example, were created from people by using subtractive magic to remove certain attributes from a person, and additive magic to put in some other desired ability or quality. Still others, they simply added some ability they wanted. I think dreamwalkers were such people, people who had a capability added, people who the wizards obviously intended as weapons. Jagang is a descendant of those dreamwalkers from the Great War. Now the weapon is in charge of making war. Unlike Jagang, who only wants to end our magic so he can use his against us, during the Great War, the people in the Old World truly were trying to end magic, all magic. The chimes were intended to do just that, to steal magic away from the world of life. They were conjured forth from the underworld, the Keeper's world of the dead. As Zed explained, such a thing conjured from the underworld once unleashed not only may end magic, but in so doing could very well extinguish life itself. He also said he and Anne could take care of it. Kalin said. Richard looked back over his shoulder. Then why did he lie to us? Why didn't he trust us? If he really can take care of it, why not simply tell us the truth? He shook his head. Something more is going on. Du Shailu, long silent, impatiently folded her arms. Our blade masters will easily cut down these filthy... Hush! Richard crossed his finger over her lips. Don't say another word, Du Shailu. You don't understand this. You don't know what trouble you might cause. When Richard was sure Du Shailu would remain silent, he turned away from everyone again to stare off toward the clearing skies to the northeast, toward Adendril. He was tired of arguing. He knew the truth of the chimes being loose. He needed to think what to do about them. There were things he needed to know. He remembered that while frantically searching Kolo's journal for other information, he had come across places where Kolo talked about the chimes, among a great many other things. Wizards were continually sending messages and reports back to the wizard's keep in Adendril, not only relaying information concerning the chimes, but also reporting on any number of other frightening and potentially catastrophic events that were taking place. Kolo wrote about those communications, at least the ones he found interesting, significant, or curious. But he didn't give complete accounts of them, he would have had no reason to reproduce them in his private journal. Richard doubted Kolo ever intended anyone to read the journals. 
Colo's habit was to briefly mention the pertinent information from a message and then remark on the matter at hand, so the information Richard read on the reports had been frustratingly sketchy and opinionated. Colo set down more information when he was frightened, seeming almost to use his journal as a way to think through a problem in an effort to find a solution. There was a period of time when he had been very frightened by what the reports were saying in regard to the chimes. In several places, Colo wrote down what he had read in reports almost as if to justify his fear, to underscore for himself his grounds for concern. Richard recalled Colo mentioning the wizard who had been sent to deal with the chimes. Ander. Somebody Ander. Richard couldn't remember the whole name. Wizard Ander proudly bore the cognomen the mountain. Apparently he was big. Colo didn't like the man, though, and in his private journal often derisively referred to him as the moral molehill. Richard gathered from Colo's journal that Ander thought a lot of himself. Richard clearly remembered at one point Colo expressing indignation that people were failing to properly apply the wizard's fifth rule. Mind what people do, not only what they say, for deeds will betray a lie. Colo had seemed incensed when he scrawled that by not minding the totality of the actions, people were failing to properly apply the fifth rule to Wizard Ander. He complained that if they had, they would have easily discovered that the man's true allegiance lay solely with himself and not with the good of his people. Page 205. You still have not said what the chimes are, Kara said. Richard felt the insistent breeze tug at his hair and his golden cloak, as if urging him onward. To where he didn't know. Here and there, bugs lifted out of the wet spring grass to loop through the air. Far off to the east, backlit by the billowing honeyed storm clouds, the dark dots of geese in an undulating V formation were winging their way north. Richard had never given any serious thought to the chimes when the subject came up at the wedding. Zed had dismissed their concern. And besides, Richard's mind was on other things. But later, after the chicken had been killed outside the spirit house, after Junie had been murdered, after the chicken thing gave him goose flesh every time it was anywhere near, and after Zed had filled in some of the details, Richard's rising sense of alarm had caused him to give himself over to recalling everything he could about the chimes. At the time, he had been searching Colo's journal for solutions to other problems and hadn't been paying particular attention to the information on the chimes, but nearly constant concentration and occasional trance-like effort had brought back a great deal. The chimes are ancient beings spawned in the underworld. The grace must be breached to bring them into the world of life. Being from the underworld, they were conjured from the subtractive side alone and so create an imbalance once in this world. Magic needs balance. Being totally subtractive, their mere presence here requires additive magic for them to exist in this state, since existence is a form of additive power, and so the chimes drain magic away from this world as long as they're here. Kara, never being one with any outward appearance of an aptitude for magic, appeared only more confused than ever by his answer. Richard understood her confusion. He didn't know much about magic either, and barely had a grasp of what he had just told her. He wasn't even convinced it was accurate. But how do they do that? she asked. You might think of the world of life as like a barrel of water. The chimes are a hole in that barrel that has just been uncorked, letting the water drain away. Once the water all drains off, the barrel will dry out, the staves will shrink, and it will no longer be the container it once was. You might say it is then a dead shell, only resembling what it once was. The chime's mere existence here drains magic away from the world of life, like that hole in the barrel. But also, as a way to bring them into this world, they were conjured as creatures. They have a nature of their own. They can kill. Being creatures of magic, they have the ability, if they wish, to take on the appearance of the creature they kill, such as a chicken but they retain all the power of what they truly are. When I shot the chicken with an arrow, the chime fled its phantom form. From the beginning, the real chicken had been lying dead behind the wall. The chime only borrowed its form as a pattern, as a disguise, to taunt us. Kara took on the unfamiliar countenance of worry. 
You mean to tell me, she glanced at the people around her, that anyone here could really be a chime? From what I gather, they are conjured creatures and have no soul, so they can't take on the appearance of a person, just animals. According to Zed, the converse is true. Jagang has a soul, and so can only enter the mind of a person because a soul is needed. When the wizards created weapons out of people, those things they created still had souls. That was how they could be controlled, at least to some extent. The chimes, once here, could not be governed. That was one of the things that made them so dangerous. It's like trying to reason with lightning. All right. Kara held up a finger as if making a mental note for herself. So it couldn't be a person. That's good. She gestured to the sky. But could it be that one of those metal larks is a chime? Richard glanced up at the yellow-breasted birds flitting past. I guess so. If it could be a chicken, it surely could kill any animal and take its form. It wouldn't need to, though. Richard pointed at the wet ground. It could just as easily be hiding in that puddle at your feet. Some apparently have an affinity for water. Kara looked down at the puddle and then took a step back. You mean the chime that killed Juni was hiding in the water? Stalking him? Richard glanced briefly at Chandelin and then with a single nod acknowledged his belief that it was so. Chimes hide or wait in dark places, he went on. They somehow travel along the edges of things, such as cracks in rock or along the water's edge. I'm assuming so, anyway. The way Colo put it was that they slip along borders where this meets that. Some hide in fire, and they can travel on sparks. He glanced at Kalen out of the corner of his eye as he recalled the way the House of the Dead, where Junie's body lay, had burst into flame. When annoyed or angered, they will sometimes burn a place down, just for spite. It was said that some are of such beauty that to see them is to take your breath away forever. They are only vaguely visible, unless you catch their attention. Colo's journal made it sound like once the victim sees them, they are partially shaped by the victim's own desire, and that desire is irresistible. That must be how they were able to seduce people to their death. Maybe that's what happened to Juni. Maybe he saw something so beautiful that he abandoned his weapons, his judgment, even his common sense, and followed it down into the water where he drowned. Yet others crave attention and like to be worshipped. I guess because they came from the underworld, they share the Keeper's hunger for veneration. It was said that some even protected those who uncritically revered them, but it's a dangerous balancing act. It lulls them, according to what Colo said but if you stop worshipping them, they will turn on you. They enjoy most the hunt, never tiring of it. They hunt people. They are without mercy. They enjoy especially killing with fire. The full translation of their name from Haidaharan roughly means the chimes of doom or the chimes of death. Du Shailu was scowlingly silent. The Bakatao Mana blade masters, for the most part, managed to continue to look indifferent, aloof, and relaxed, but they had a new restiveness in their posture that to Richard was inescapable. Either way, Kara said with a sigh, I think we can grasp the idea. Chandelin, listening attentively, finally spoke up. But you do not believe this, Mother Confessor? You believe what Zed had to say, that it is not these chimes of death? Kalin met Richard's gaze before addressing Chandelin. Her tone wasn't harsh. Zed's explanation of the problem is in many ways similar, and so could just as easily account for what's happened. But being similar, it would be no less dangerous. The important difference from what he told us is that when we get to Adendril, we will be able to halt the trouble. I reluctantly hold Zed was right. I don't believe it's the chimes. I wish that were the case, I really do. Because as you said, when we get to Adendril, we could counter it, Richard said but it's the chimes. I would guess Zed simply wanted to get us out of harm's way while he saw to trying to solve the problem of sending the chimes back to the underworld. Lord Rawl is the magic against magic, Kara said to Kalin. He would know best about this. He believes it is the chimes, so it must be the chimes. Sighing in frustration, Kalin pushed her long hair back over her shoulder. 
Richard, you're talking yourself into believing this is the chimes. By talking about it as being true, you're starting to convince Kara, just as you've convinced yourself. Just because you're afraid of it being true, you're giving it more credence than it deserves. She was obviously reminding him of the wizard's first rule, suggesting that he was believing a lie. Richard weighed the fiery determination so evident in her green eyes. He needed her to help him. He couldn't face this alone. He finally decided he had no choice. Asking everyone to wait, he put an arm around her shoulders and walked her away so he could be sure the others wouldn't hear. He needed her to believe in him. He no longer had any choice. He had to tell her. Chapter 29 Kalin went willingly as he walked her off through the wet grass, more content to argue with him alone than in front of everyone else. For Richard's part, he didn't want to tell her what he had to say in front of others. Over his shoulder, Richard saw Chondolin's hunters leaning casually on their spears. Spears dipped in poison. They looked to lazily wait for Richard and Kalin to finish their talk in return. He knew there was nothing lazy about them. He could see they were strategically positioned to keep the Bakatal Mana under guard. This was their land, after all. And despite them knowing Richard, the Bakatal Mana were outsiders. The Bakatal Mana, for their part, looked completely indifferent to the mud people hunters. The blade masters spoke a few nonchalant words to one another, looked out at the storm clouds on the horizon, or stretched and yawned. Richard had fought Bakaban Mana blade masters. He knew they were anything but indifferent. They were poised to kill. Having lived a tenuous existence surrounded by enemies bent on destroying them, their nature by training was to be prepared to kill at any moment. When Richard had been with Sister Verna, and they had first encountered the Blade Masters, he had asked her if they were dangerous. Sister Verna told him that when she was young, she had seen a Bakaban Mana Blade Master who had gotten into the garrison in Tanamura kill nearly fifty well-armed soldiers before he was taken down. She said they fought as if they were invincible spirits, and that some people believed they were. Richard wouldn't like some small lapse in judgment or misstep in understanding to bring the mud people and the Baka Tal Mana to a fight. They were all too good at fighting. Kara, looking anything but dispassionate, painted them all with her glares. Like the three sides of a triangle, the mud people, the Baka Tal Mana, and Kara were all part of the same struggle. They were all allied to Richard and Kalin and to their cause, even though each looked at the world differently. They all valued most of the same things in life, family, friends, hard work, honesty, duty, loyalty, freedom. Kalin placed her hand gently but insistently on his chest. Richard, despite anything else I'm feeling at the moment, I know your heart is in the right place, but you simply aren't being reasonable. You're the seeker of truth. You have to stop insisting you're right and see the truth of this. We can stop the sisters' magic and their lurk. Zed and Anne will counter the spell. Why are you being so obstinate? Kalen, he said, keeping his voice low. The chicken thing was a chime. She absently, unconsciously, fingered the dark stone on the delicate gold chain around her neck. Richard, you know I love you and you know I believe in you, but in this case I've just about... Kalen, he said, cutting her off. He knew what she thought and what she had to say. Now he wanted her only to listen. He waited until her eyes told him she would. You called the chimes into this world. You didn't do it intentionally or to cause harm. No one would believe otherwise. You did it to save me. I was near death and needed your help, so I'm part of this too. Without my actions, yours would not have been necessary. Don't forget our ancestors. Had they not born children, we wouldn't have been born to commit our crimes. I suppose you want to hold them to account, too. He wet his lips as he gently gripped her shoulders. I'm just saying that giving help is the thing that started this. That does not, however, in any sense make you guilty of malicious intent. You must understand that. But because you spoke the words completing the spell, that makes you inadvertently responsible. You brought the chimes into this world. For some reason, Zed didn't want us to know. I wish he would have trusted us with the truth, but he didn't. I'm sure he had reasons that to him seemed important enough to make him lie to us. For all I know, maybe they were. Kalin put her fingertips to her forehead, closed her eyes, and sighed with forbearance. 
Richard, I agree there are puzzling aspects to what Zed did, and there are matters yet to be answered, but that doesn't mean we have to leap to a different answer just for the sake of having one. Zed is first wizard. We must trust in what he's asked us to do. Richard touched her cheek. He wished he could be alone with her, really alone, and he could try to make up for his foolish forgetfulness. He dearly didn't want to be telling her these things, but he had to. Please, Kaylin, listen to what I have to say, and then you decide. I want to be wrong, I really do. You decide. When the mud people hunters were guarding us in the spirit house, the chimes were outside. One of them killed a chicken, just because they like to kill. When Junie heard the noise, the same as I heard it, he investigated, but found nothing. He then insulted the spirit of the killer in order to bring it out in the open. It came out in the open and killed him for insulting them. I insulted the chicken thing, so why didn't it kill me? Kaylin wearily wiped a hand across her eyes. Answer me that, Richard. Why didn't it kill me? He gazed into her beautiful green eyes for a moment as he gathered his courage. The chime told you why, Kaylin. What? She said with a squint. What are you talking about? That chicken thing wasn't a lurk. It was a chime. And it wasn't calling you by your title of Mother Confessor. It was a chime. It said what it meant. It called you Mother. Kalen stared at him in startled, wide-eyed shock. They respect you, he said. To some limited extent, anyway, because you brought them into the world of life. You gave them life. They consider you their life-giver, their mother. You only assumed the chicken thing was going to add the word confessor after it called you mother because you are so used to hearing yourself called by that title. But the chime wasn't calling you by title, Kalen. It was calling you by the name it meant, mother. He could almost see the truth of his words inundating her carefully constructed fortress of rationale. Some truths, after a certain point, could be felt viscerally and at that point everything clicked with the finality of a deadbolt on a prison of truth. Kalin's eyes filled with tears. She pressed closer to him into the comfort and understanding of his arms. She gasped a sob against his chest and then angrily wiped her cheek as a tear rolled down. I think that was the only thing that saved you, he said softly as he hugged her. I wouldn't want to again trust your life to their charity. We have to stop them. She stifled another sob. Dear spirits, we have to stop them. I know. Do you know what to do? She asked. Do you have any idea how to send them back to the world of the dead? Not yet. To find a solution, the first thing to be done is to recognize the true problem. I guess we've done that now. Kaylin nodded as she wiped at her eyes. As quickly as understanding had brought tears, resolve banished them. Why would the chimes have been outside the spirit house? While they had been together after being married, exulting in their love, something had been outside the door, exulting in death. It made him feel sick at his stomach just to think about it. I don't know. Maybe the chimes wanted to be near you. Kaylin simply nodded. She understood, near their mother. Richard remembered the stricken look on Kaylin's face when Nissel brought the stillborn baby into the house of the dead. The chimes had caused that too. It was only the beginning. What's a fatal grace? You mentioned it before, yesterday, when we went to see Zed and Anne. Most of the stories about the chimes that I recounted came from an early report. Because Kolo was frightened, he wrote at greater length than usual. The report he quoted said at the end, Mark well my words, beware the chimes, and if need be great, draw for yourself thrice on the barren earth in sand and salt and blood a fatal grace. And what does that mean? I don't know. I was hoping maybe Zed or Anne might know. He knows all about the grace. I thought he might know about this. But do you think this fatal grace would stop the chimes? I just don't know, Kalen. It occurred to me that it might be desperate advice on suicide. Kalen nodded absently as she mulled over the words from Colo's journal. I could understand if it was advice on suicide. I could feel its evil she said as she stared off into her visions. When I was in the house, where the mud people prepared bodies for burial, and the chicken thing, the chime, was in there with me, I could feel its evil. 
dear spirits, it was awful. It was pecking out Junie's eyes. Even though he was dead, it still wanted to peck out his eyes. He pulled her into his arms again. I know. She pushed away with rekindled hope. Yesterday, with Zed and Anne, you told us Colo said they were quite alarmed at first. But after investigating, they discovered the chimes were a simple weapon and easily overcome. Yes, but Colo only reported the relief at the wizard's keep when they discovered it wasn't the problem to counter they at first thought it would be. He didn't write down the solution. They sent a wizard they called the Mountain to see to it. Obviously, he did. Do you have any idea if there are any weapons that would be effective against them? Junie was heavily armed, and it didn't do him any good. But might there be others? Colo never gave any indication. Arrows didn't kill the chicken thing, and fire certainly isn't going to harm them. However, Zed was emphatic that I retrieved the Sword of Truth. If he lied about it being a lurk, that may have been to keep us away from harm. I don't believe he would lie about the sword. He wanted me to get it, and he said it might be the only magic that would still work to protect us. I believe him in that much of it. Why do you suppose the chicken thing fled from you? I mean, if they consider me their mother, I could understand them maybe having some kind of reverence for me and being reluctant to harm me, but if they're so powerful, why would they run from you? You only shot at them with an arrow. You said arrows couldn't hurt them. Why would it run from you? Richard raked back his hair. I've wondered about that myself. The only answer I've been able to come up with is that they're creatures of subtractive magic, and I'm the only one in thousands of years born with that side of magic. Maybe they fear my subtractive magic can harm them. Maybe it can. It's a hope, anyway. And the fire? That one lone bit of our wedding bonfires that was still burning that you snuffed out? That was one of them, wasn't it? Richard hated that they had been in their wedding bonfire. It was a defilement. Yes, Centrosi, the second chime. It means fire. Richani, the first, means water. The third, Vasi, means air. But you put out the fire. The chime didn't do anything to stop you. If they would kill Juni for insulting them, it certainly seems they would be angered by what you did. The chicken thing, too, ran from you. I don't know, Kalen. I don't have an answer. Peering into his eyes, she hesitated for a moment. Maybe they didn't harm you for the same reason they didn't harm me. They think I, too, am their mother? Father, she said, unconsciously stroking the dark stone at her throat. I used the spell to keep you alive, to keep you from crossing over into the world of the dead. The spell called the chimes because they were from the other side and had the power to do that. Maybe, since we were both involved, they think of us as father and mother, as their parents. Richard let out a long breath. That's possible. I'm not saying it isn't, but when I felt them near, I just got the sense of something more to it. Something that made my hair stand on end. More? More like what? It was an overwhelming sense of their lust whenever they were near me, and at the same time monstrous loathing. Kaylin rubbed her arms, chilled by such obscene wickedness among them. A humorless smile, bitter with irony, crossed her face. Shota always said we would together conceive a monstrous offspring. Richard cupped her cheek. Someday, Kaylin. Someday. On the verge of tears, she turned from his hand, his gaze, to stare off at the horizon. She cleared her throat and gathered her voice. If magic is failing, at least Jagang will lose his help. He controls those with magic to help his army. At least if he could no longer do that, there would be that much good in all this. He used one of those wizards to try to kill us. He was able to use one of the Sisters of the Light to bring the plague from the Temple of the Winds. If magic fails because of the chimes, at least it will fail for Jagang, too. Richard pulled his lower lip through his teeth. I've been thinking about that. If the chicken thing was afraid of me because I have subtractive magic, Jagang's control over those with magic might very well no longer work. But, dear spirits, 
she whispered, turning back to look up at him. The Sisters of the Dark. They may not have been born with it, but they know how to use subtractive magic. Richard nodded reluctantly. I fear that Jagang, if nothing else, might still have the Sisters of the Dark. Their magic will work. Our only hope, then, is with Zed and Anne. Let's hope they will be able to stop the chimes. Richard couldn't force a smile for her. How? Neither of them is able to use subtractive magic. The magic they do have is failing along with all other magic. They will be just as helpless as that unborn child that died. I'm sure they've gone, but where? She gave him a look, very much a mother confessor look. Had you remembered your first wife when you should have, Richard, we could have told Zed. It might have made a difference. Now that chance is lost to us. You picked a very bad time to become negligent. He wanted to argue with her, tell her it wouldn't have made any difference, tell her she was wrong, but he couldn't. She wasn't wrong. Zed would have gone off alone to battle the chimes. Richard wondered if they might go back and track his grandfather. She at last took his hand in hers, gave it a brave pat with her other, and then marched them back to where the others waited. She held her head erect. Her face was a confessor's face, devoid of emotion, full of authority. We don't yet know what to do about them, Kalin announced. But I'm convinced beyond doubt. The chimes are loose upon the world. Chapter 30 For the benefit of the hunters, Kalin repeated her announcement in the mud people's language. Richard wished she had been right that it was the lurk and not the chimes. They would have had a solution for the lurk. Everyone looked understandably disquieted to hear Kalin, after having been so steadfast in her arguments it was the lurk, now tell them she accepted beyond doubt the fact that they were confronted with nothing less than the full threat of the chimes. It didn't look to Richard, once she had said she agreed with him, that anyone still harbored doubts of their own. With Kalin's words, it seemed the world had for everyone just changed. Uneasy silence enveloped the plains. Richard needed to get on with trying to figure out what to do next, but didn't really have any idea how to do that. He didn't even know where to start. He now realized what he should have done when he had the chance. He had been so intent on the danger he had ignored everything else. He was a long way from the woods he knew. He wished he were back in those woods. At least when he had been a guide, he never forgot what path he was on or led anyone over a cliff. He turned his attention to the Bakatao Mana's dark-haired spirit woman. Du Shailu, why have you come all this way? What are you doing here? Ah, Du Shailu said as she folded her hands before herself with deliberate care. Now the Kaharan wishes me to speak. The woman was bottled ire. Richard didn't really see why, and he didn't really care. Yes, why have you come? We have traveled many days. We have suffered hardship. We have buried some of those who started with us. We have had to fight our way through hostile places. We have shed the blood of many to reach you. We left our families and loved ones to bear a warning to our Kaharan. We have gone without food, without sleep, and without the comfort of a safe place. We have faced nights where we all wept, for we felt afraid and sick at heart away from our homeland. I have traveled with the child the Kaharan asked me to bear when I would have gone to an herb woman and shed it shed the dreadful memories I carry with it. Yet he does not even acknowledge that I chose to honor his words and accept the responsibility of this child thrust upon me. The Kaharan does not even recognize that I must every day be reminded by the child he asked me to bear of the time I spent chained naked to a wall in the stinking place of the Majendi. Reminded of where I came to be with this child. Reminded of how those men used me for their pleasure and then laughed at me. Reminded of where I daily endured the fear that would be the day I was to be butchered and sacrificed. Reminded of where I wept my heart out for my own babies, who would be left without their mother, and wept that I would never again see their little smiles or have the joy of watching them grow. But I honored the Kaharan's words and carried the child of dogs, because the Kaharan asked it of me. The Kaharan pays his own people who have journeyed all this way little more than passing notice, as if we were no more than fleas at which he must scratch. He asks not how we do in our homeland. He does not invite us to at long last sit with him that we might rejoice to be together. 
He asks not if we are at peace. He inquires not if we are fed or if we are thirsty. He only shouts and argues that we are not his people because he is ignorant of the sacred laws by which we have lived for countless centuries and dismisses those same laws solely because he was not taught their words, as if that alone makes them unimportant. Many have died by those laws so that he might learn by them and live another day. He gives his people no more thought than the dung beneath his boots. He turns his wife by our law away from his mind without a second thought. He treats his wife by law as a pest to be put aside until he has want of her. The old laws promised us a kaharin. I admit they did not promise us one who would honor his people and their ways and laws that have joined us in purpose, although I thought any man would honor those who have suffered so much for him. I have suffered the loss of my husbands by your hand and grieved out of your sight so that you might not suffer for it. My children have endured with brave sorrow the loss of their fathers by your hand. They weep at bed for the man who kissed their brow and wished them good dreams of their homeland. Yet you do not bother to ask how I fare without those husbands who I and my children love dearly. Nor do you even ask how my children fare in their heartache. You do not even ask how I fare without my new husband by our law while he is off acquiring other wives. You think so little of me that you bother not to mention my existence to your new wife. Du Shailu's chin rose with indignation. So, now I am permitted to speak. So now you wish at last to hear my words after my long and difficult journey. So now you wish to hear if I have anything worthy of your lofty ears. Du Shailu spat at his feet. You shame me. She folded her arms and turned her back to him. Richard stared at the back of her head. The blade masters were peering off as if deaf and wishing for little more than to spot a bird in the sky. Du Shailu, Richard said, growing a bit heated himself. Don't lay the death of those people on me. I tried everything I knew to keep from having to fight them, from harming them. You know I did. I begged you to stop it. It was within your power, yet you would not halt it. I was loath to do as I did. You know I had no choice. She glared over her shoulder. You had choice. You could have chosen to die rather than to kill. In honor of what you have done for me, saving me from the Majendi sacrifice, I promised you that if you did not resist, your death would be quick. It would have been your one life lost instead of thirty. If you are so noble and so concerned for preserving life, then you would have let it be so. Richard ground his teeth and shook his finger at her. You have your men attack me, and you expect me to simply let myself be murdered rather than defend myself after I saved you? Had I died instead of those men, the killing would have then started in earnest. You know I brought a peace that saved many more lives, and you don't understand the first thing about the rest of it. She huffed. You are wrong, my husband. She turned her back again. I understand more than you wish I did. Kara rolled her eyes. Lord Rawl, you really need to learn to respect your wives better, or you will never have a moment of domestic tranquility. She spoke out of the side of her mouth as she stepped past him. Let me speak with her, woman to woman. See if I can't smooth things over for you. Kara hooked a hand under Du Shailu's arm to walk her off for a private talk. Six swords cleared their scabbards. In the blink of an eye, steel was spinning in the morning light as the blade masters advanced, passing the whirling weapons back and forth, from left hand to right and back again. The mud people hunters moved to block them. Within the space of a heartbeat, the plains had gone from uneasy peace to the brink of a bloody battle. Richard threw up his hands. Everyone stop! He moved in front of Kara and Du Shailu, blocking the men's advance. Kara let go of her. She is their spirit woman. You are not permitted to touch her. The Bakaban Mana were persecuted and sacrificed by the Majendi for millennia. They are understandably fractious when it comes to strangers laying hands on them. Kara released Du Shailu's arm, but both groups of men were unwilling to be the first to back down. The mud people had suddenly hostile strangers on their hands. The Bakatao Mana suddenly had men about to attack them for defending their spirit woman. With all the heated blood, the risk was that someone would go for the advantage of striking first and later worry about counting the dead. Richard held one hand up. Listen to me, all of you. With his other hand, he reached out and tugged on the leather thong around Du Shailu's neck, hoping it held under the neckline of her dress what he thought it did. The hunter's eyes widened when Richard pulled it free and they saw the bird man's whistle on the end of that thong. 
This is the whistle the bird man gave to me. He glanced out of the corner of his eye at Kaylin and whispered for her to translate. She began talking to the hunters in the mud people's language as Richard went on. You remember the bird man, in a gesture of peace, giving me this whistle? This woman, Du Shailu, is a protector of her people. In the bird man's honor, and in his hope for peace, I gave her the whistle so she could call birds to eat the seeds her enemies planted. When her enemies feared they would have no crops and starve, they finally agreed to peace. It was the first time these two peoples ever had peace, and they all owe that peace to the great gift of the bird man's whistle. The Baka Tau Mana owe the mud people a great debt. The mud people also owe a debt to the Baka Tau Mana for honoring that gift as the mud people intended it by using it to bring peace rather than harm. The mud people should be proud that the Baka Tau Mana would trust in the mud people's gift to bring their family safety. Your two peoples are friends. No one moved as they considered Richard's words. Finally, Jian put his sword over his shoulder, letting it hang behind his back by the cord around his neck. He pulled open his outfit, exposing his chest to Chandelin. We thank you and your people for the safety and peace brought to our people by your gift of powerful magic. We will not fight you. If you wish to take back the peace you have given us, you may strike at our hearts. We will not defend ourselves against such great peace givers as the mud people. Chandelin withdrew his spear, planting the butt in the soil of his homeland. Wretched with the temper speaks the truth. We are pleased your people used our gift as it was meant to be used to bring peace. You will be welcomed and safe while in our homeland. Accompanied by a lot of arm waving, Chandelin gave orders to his hunters. As all the men began standing down, Richard at last let out his breath and thanked the good spirits for their help. Kalin took Du Shailu's arm and spoke with finality. I am going to have a talk with Du Shailu. The Baka Tal Mana clearly didn't like it, but were now unsure what to do about it. Richard wasn't sure if he liked the idea either. It might be the start of another war. Reluctantly, though, he decided he had better let Kalin have her way and talk to Du Shailu. He could tell by the look on Kalin's face that it wasn't his decision to make anyway. He turned to the Blade Masters. Kalin, my wife, is the mother confessor and the leader of all the people of the New World. She is to be respected as is our spirit woman, Du Shailu. You have my word as Kaharan that the Mother Confessor will not harm Du Shailu. If I lie to you, you may consider my life forfeit. The men nodded their agreement. Richard didn't know if he or Du Shailu ranked higher in their eyes, but his calm and reassuring tone, if nothing else, helped to disarm their objections. He knew, too, that if nothing else, these men respected him, not just because he had killed 30 of their number, but because he had done something much more difficult. He had returned them to their ancestral homeland. Richard stood shoulder to shoulder with Kara, watching Kalin walk Du Shailu off into the tall grass. It still glistened with droplets of water from the night's rain that had here and there left behind puddles. Lord Rall, Kara asked under her breath, do you think that is wise? I trust Kalin's judgment. We have a great deal of trouble on our hands. We don't have any time to waste. Kara rolled her aegeal in her fingers, considering it for a long, silent moment. Lord Rall, if magic is failing, has yours failed yet? Let's hope not. Kara stayed close by his side as he approached the Blade Masters. Though he recognized several, he only knew one by name. Jian, Du Shailu said some of your people died on your journey here. Jian sheathed his sword. Three. In battle? Looking uncomfortable, the man swiped his dark hair back off his forehead. One. The other two had accidents. Involving fire or water? John let out a heavy-hearted breath. Not water, but while standing watch one fell into the fire. He burned to death before we knew what had happened. At the time, we thought he must have fallen and hit his head. From what you say, maybe this was not true. Maybe these chimes killed him? Richard nodded. He whispered in sorrow the name of one of the chimes of death, Centrosi, the chime of fire. And the third? John shifted his weight to his other foot. Coming across a high trail, he suddenly thought he could fly. Fly? John nodded. 
but he could fly no better than a rock. Maybe he lost his footing and fell. I saw his face just before he tried to fly. He was smiling as he did when he saw our homeland for the first time. Again, in sorrow, Richard whispered the name of the third chime. The three chimes, Richani, Centrosi, Vasi, water, fire, air, had claimed more lives. The chimes have killed mud people, too. I had been hoping they were only here, where Kalen and I are, but it seems the chimes are other places, too. Over the shoulders of the six blade masters, Richard saw that the mud people had flattened an area of grass and were preparing to start a fire in order to share a meal with their new friends. Chandelin! The man looked up. Don't start a fire! Richard trotted over to where Chandelin and his hunters waited. What is the trouble? Chandelin asked. Why do you wish us not to have fire? As long as we are to stop here for a time, we wish to cook meat and share our food. Richard scratched his brow. The evil spirit that killed Juni can find people through water and fire. I'm sorry, but you need to keep your people from using fire for the time being. If you use fire, you may have more evil spirits killing your people. Are you sure? Richard put a hand on Jian's shoulder. These people are strong like the mud people. On their way here, one of them was killed by an evil spirit from a fire. Chandelin took in John's nod that it was true. Before we knew what was happening, he was burned alive by the fire, John said. He was a strong man and brave. He was not a man to be taken easily by an enemy. But we did not hear a word before he died. Frustration tightened Chandelin's jaw as he looked out over the plains before returning his attention to Richard. But if we cannot have fire, how are we to eat? We must bake taba bread and cook our food. We cannot eat raw dough and raw meat. The women use fire to make pottery. The men use it to make weapons. How are we to live? Richard let out a frustrated sigh. I don't know, Chandelin. I only know that fire may bring the evil spirit, the chimes, again. I'm simply telling you the only thing I know to do to help keep our people safe. I guess you will be forced to use fire, but keep in mind the danger it may bring. If everyone knows of the danger, maybe it will be safe to use fire when you must. And are we not to drink for fear of going near water? Chandelin, I wish I knew the answers. Richard wiped a weary hand across his face. I only know that water, fire, and high places are dangerous. The chimes are able to use those things to harm people. The more we can stay away from them, the safer we will be. But even if we do this, from what you said before, the chimes will still kill. I don't have nearly enough answers, Chandelin. I'm trying to tell you everything I can think of in order that you might help keep our people safe. There very well may be yet more dangers I don't even know about. Chandelin put his hands on his hips as he looked out over his people's grasslands. His jaw muscles flexed as he thought on matters Richard could only guess. Richard waited silently until Chandelin spoke. Is it true, as you said, that a child yet to be born in our village died because of these chimes of death that are loose in the world? I'm sorry, Chandelin, but I believe it is so. His intent dark eyes met Richard's gaze. How did these evil spirits come to be in this world? Richard licked the corners of his mouth. I believe Kalen, without realizing it or intending it, may have called them with magic in order to save my life. Because they were used to save my life, it is my fault they are here. Chandelin considered Richard's admission. The mother confessor would not intend harm. You would not intend harm. Yet it is because of you the chimes of death are here. Chandelin's tone had changed from confusion and alarm to authority. He was, after all, now an elder. He had a responsibility to the safety of his people that went beyond that of Hunter. In much the way the mud people and the Baka Talmana shared many of the same values, yet had nearly come to blows, Chandelin and Richard had at one time a fractious relationship. Fortunately, they both now understood that they shared much more in common than they disagreed about. Richard looked out at the distant clouds and the sheets of rain lashing the dark and distant horizon. I'm afraid that's the truth of it. Added to that, I neglected to remember valuable information to tell Zed when I had the chance. Now he will be gone in search of the chimes. 
Chandalin again considered Richard's words before speaking. You are mud people, and have both struggled to protect us. We know you both did not mean to bring the chimes and cause harm. Chandalin drew himself up tall. He didn't come up to Richard's shoulder and delivered his pronouncement. We know you and the Mother Confessor both will do what you must to set this right. Richard understood only too well the code of responsibility, obligation, and duty by which this man lived. Though he and Chandalin came from very different peoples with very different cultures, Richard had grown up by many of the same standards. Perhaps, he thought, they weren't really that different. Maybe they wore different clothes, but they had much the same heart, the same longings, and the same desires. They shared, too, many of the same fears. Not only Richard's stepfather, but also Zed, had taught him many of the very things Chandalin's people had taught him. If you brought harm, no matter the reason, you had to set it right as best you could. While it was understandable to be afraid, and no one would expect you not to be, the worst thing you could do was to run from the trouble you had caused. No matter how accidental it was, you didn't try to deny it. You didn't run. You did what you must to right it. If not for Richard, the chimes would not be free. Kalin's actions to save his life had already cost others theirs. She, too, would not waver for an instant from their duty to do whatever they could to stop the chimes. It wasn't even a question open to debate. You have my solemn word, Elder Chandalin. I will not rest until the mud people and everyone else are safe from the chimes. I will not rest until the chimes are back in the underworld where they belong, or I will die trying. A small smile, warm with pride, crept onto Chandalin's face. I knew I did not need to remind you of your promise to always protect our people. But it is good to hear from your own lips that you have not forgotten your vow. Chandalin surprised Richard with a hard slap. Strength to Richard with the temper. May his anger burn hot and swift against our enemies. Richard comforted his stinging jaw and had turned from Chandalin when he noticed Kalin returning with Du Shailu. For a woods guide, Kara said, you managed to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Do you think you will have any wives left now that they are finished? He knew Kara was only nettling him, in her odd way trying to buoy his spirits. One, I hope. Well, if not, Kara said with a smirk, we will always have each other. Richard made for the other two women. The position of wife is filled, thank you. Kalin and Du Shailu walked side by side through the grass, their faces showing no emotion. At least he didn't see any blood. Your other wife has convinced me to talk to you, Du Shailu said when Richard met them. You are fortunate to have us both, she added. Richard thought better of opening his mouth, lest he allow to leap off his tongue the flip remark dancing impatiently there. Chapter 31 Du Shailu walked off to her blade masters, apparently telling the men to sit and rest themselves while she spoke with the Kaharan. While she was seeing to that, Kalin, with the end of her finger in his ribs, prodded Richard in the direction of their gear. Get Du Shailu a blanket to sit on, Kalin murmured. Why does she need ours? They have their own blankets with them. Besides, she doesn't need a blanket to sit on to tell me why she's here. Kalin poked his ribs again. Just get it, she said under her breath so the others wouldn't hear. In case you hadn't noticed, the woman is pregnant and could use a rest off her feet. Well, that doesn't... Richard, Kalin snapped, hushing him. When you insist someone submit to your will, it is accomplished most easily if you give them a small victory so they can retain their dignity while they do as you insist. If you wish, I will carry it over to her. Well, Richard said, all right then, I guess. See, you just proved it. And you will carry the blanket. So do Shailu gets a small victory, but I don't. You're a big boy. Du Shailu's price is a blanket to sit on while she tells you why she's here. The price is minuscule. Don't continue a war we have already won just to make the opponent's humiliation crushing and complete. But she... I know. Du Shailu was out of line in what she said to you. You know it. I know it. She knows it. But her feelings were hurt and not entirely without cause. We all make mistakes. She didn't understand the dimensions of the danger we have only just discovered we face. 
She has agreed to peace for the price of our blanket to sit upon. She only wants you to pay her a courtesy. It won't hurt you to indulge her sensibilities. Richard glanced over his shoulder when they reached their things. Du Shailu was speaking to the blade masters. You threaten her? Richard whispered as he pulled his blanket from his pack. Oh, yes, Kaylin whispered back. She put a hand on his arm. Be gentle. Her ears are liable to be a bit tender after our little talk. Richard marched over and made a show of flattening the grass and spreading his blanket on the ground before Du Shailu. With the flat of his hand, he smoothed out the bigger wrinkles. He set a water skin in the middle. When finished, he held out a hand in invitation. Please, Du Shailu. He couldn't make himself address her as his wife, but he didn't think that mattered. Sit and speak with me. Your words are important and time is precious. She inspected the way he had matted down the grass, all in one direction, and scrutinized the blanket. Satisfied with the arrangement, she sat at one end and crossed her legs under herself. With her back straight, her chin held high, and her hands clasped in her lap, she looked somehow noble. He guessed she was. Richard flipped his golden cape back over his shoulders and sat cross-legged at the other end of the blanket. It wasn't very big, so their knees almost touched. He smiled politely and offered her the water skin. As she graciously accepted the water skin, he recalled the first time he had seen her. She had been in a collar and chained to a wall. She had been naked and filthy and smelled as if she had been there for months, which she had. Yet her bearing was such that she had somehow seemed to him just as noble as she did now, clean and dressed in her spirit woman prayer dress. He remembered, too, how when he had been trying to free her, she feared he was going to kill her, and she had bitten him. Just recalling it, he could almost feel her teeth marks. The troubling thought occurred to him that this woman had the gift. He wasn't sure the extent of her powers, but he could see it in her eyes. Somehow his ability allowed him to see that timeless look in the eyes of others who were at least brushed with a dusting of the gift of magic. Sister Verna had told Richard that she had tried little things on Du Shailu to test her. Verna said the spells she sent at Du Shailu disappeared like pebbles dropped down a well, and they did not go unnoticed. Du Shailu, Verna had said, knew what was being tried and was somehow able to annul it. From other things, Richard had long ago come to the realization that Du Shailu's gift involved some primitive form of prophecy. Since she had been held in chains for months, he doubted she was able to affect the world around her with her magical ability. People whose magic could affect others in an overt manner didn't need to bite, he imagined, nor would they allow themselves to be held captive to await being sacrificed. But she was able to prevent others from using magic against her. Not an uncommon form of mystical protection against the weapon of magic, Richard had learned. With the chimes in the world of life, Du Shailu's magic, whatever its extent, would fail if it hadn't already. He waited until she had her drink and had handed back the water skin before he began. Du Shailu, I need... Ask how are our people? Richard glanced up at Kaylin. Kaylin rolled her eyes and gave him a nod. Richard set down the water skin and cleared his throat. Du Shailu, I rejoice to see you are well. Thank you for considering my words of advice to keep your child. I know it is a great responsibility to raise a child. I am sure you will be rewarded with a lifetime of joy at your decision, and the child will be rewarded by your teachings. I also know my words were not as important in your decision as was your own heart. Richard didn't have to try to sound sincere, because he truly was. I'm sorry you had to leave your other babies to make this long and difficult journey to bring me your words of wisdom. I know you would not have undertaken such a long and arduous journey were it not important. She waited clearly not yet content. Richard, patiently trying to play her game, let out a breath and went on. Please, Du Shailu, tell me how the Bakataoman affair, now that they are returned at last to their ancestral homeland. Du Shailu smiled at last with satisfaction. Our people are well and happy in their homeland, thanks to you, Kaharin, but we will talk of them later. I must now tell you of why I have come. Richard made an effort to school his scowl. I'm eager to hear your words. She opened her mouth, but then scowled herself. Where is your sword? I don't have it with me. Why not? I had to leave it back in Aidendril. It's a long story, and it isn't. But how can you be the seeker if you do not have your sword? Richard drew a breath. The seeker of truth 
is a person. The sword of truth is a tool the seeker uses, much like you used the whistle to bring peace. I can still be the seeker without the sword, just as you can be the spirit woman without the gift of the whistle. It doesn't seem right. She looked dismayed. I liked your sword. It cut the iron collar off my neck and left my head where it was. It announced you to us as the Kaharan. You should have your sword. Deciding that he had played her game long enough, and considering the vital matters on his mind, he leaned forward and let his scowl have its way. I will recover my sword as soon as I return to Aidendril. We were on our way there when we met you here. The less time I spend sitting around on a good traveling day, the sooner I will arrive in Aidendril and be able to recover my sword. I'm sorry, Dushailu, if I seemed in a rush. I mean no disrespect, but I fear for innocent lives and the lives of ones I love. It is for the safety of the Bakatal Mana too that I am in a hurry. I would be thankful if you would tell me what you're doing here. People are dying. Some of your own people have lost their lives. I must see if there is anything I can do to stop the chimes. The Sword of Truth may help me. I need to get to Aidendril to get it. May we please get on with this? Dushailu smiled to herself now that he had given her the proper respect. Slowly, she seemed to lose her ability to hold the smile. Losing with it her bluster, for the first time she seemed unsure, looking suddenly small and frightened. My husband, I had a troubling vision of you. As the spirit woman, I sometimes have such visions. Good for you, but I don't want to hear it. She looked up at him. What? You said it was a vision. Yes. I don't want to hear about any visions. But but you must. It was a vision. Visions are a form of prophecy. Prophecy has yet to help me and almost always causes me grief. I don't want to hear it. But visions help. No, they do not help. They reveal the truth. They are no more true than dreams. Dreams can be true also. No, dreams are not true. They are simply dreams. Visions are not true either. They are simply visions. But I saw you in a vision. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. You were on fire. Richard heaved a breath. I've had dreams where I can fly too. That doesn't make it true. Du Shailu leaned toward him. You dream you can fly? Really? You mean like a bird? She straightened. I have never heard of such a thing. It's just a dream, Du Shailu, like your vision. But I had a vision of this. That means it is true. Just because I can fly in my dreams, that doesn't make it true. I don't go jumping off high places and flapping my arms. It's just a dream. Like your vision, I can't fly, Du Shailu. But you can burn. Richard put his hands on his knees and leaned back a little as he took a deep and patient breath. All right, fine. What else was there to this vision? Nothing. That was all. Nothing. That was it. Me on fire. Just a little dream of me on fire. Not a dream. She held up a finger to make her point. A vision, and you journeyed all this way to tell me that. Well, thank you very much for coming such a distance to tell me, but we really must be on our way now. Tell your people the Kaharan wishes them well. Good journey home. Richard made to look like he was going to get up. Unless you have something more to say, he added. Du Shailu melted a little at the rebuff. It frightened me to see my husband on fire, as well as it would frighten me to be on fire. I would not like it if the Kaharan was on fire, nor would the Kaharan like to be on fire. So, did your vision tell you how I might avoid being on fire? She looked down and picked at the blanket. No, you see, what good is it then? It is good to know such things, she said as she rolled a little fuzz ball across the blanket. It might help. Richard scratched his forehead. She was working up her courage to tell him something more important, more troubling. The vision was a pretext. He reasoned. He softened his tone, hoping to ease it out of her. Du Shailu, thank you for your warning. I will keep it in mind that it might somehow help me. She met his eyes and nodded. How did you find me? He asked. You are the Kaharan. She was looking noble again. I am the Bakatal Mana Spirit Woman, the keeper of the old laws. Your wife. Richard understood. She was bonded to him, much like the Daharans, like Kara, and like Kara, Du Shailu could sense where he was. I was a day south of here, 
You nearly missed finding me. Have you begun to have difficulty telling where I am? She looked away from his eyes as she nodded. I could always go and stand looking out at the horizon. With a breeze in my hair and the sun or stars upon my face, and I could point and say, the Kaharin is that way. She took a moment to again find her voice. It has become harder and harder to know where to point. We were in Aidendrill until just a few days ago, Richard said. You would have had to start on your journey long before I came to this place. Yes, you were not in this place when I first knew I must come to you, she gestured over her shoulder. You were much, much farther to the northeast. Why would you come here to find me if you could sense me to the northeast in Aidendrill? When I began to feel you less and less, I knew that meant there was trouble. My visions told me I needed to come to you before you were lost to me. If I had traveled to where I knew you were when I started, you would not be there when I arrived. I consulted my visions instead, while I still had them, and journeyed to where they told me you would be. Toward the end of our journey, I could feel you were now in this place. Soon after, I could no longer feel you. We were still a goodly distance away, so all we could do was to continue on in this direction. The good spirits answered my prayers and allowed our paths to cross. I am pleased the good spirits help you, Du Charlu. You are a good person and deserve their help. She picked at the blanket again. But my husband does not believe in my visions. Richard wet his lips. My father used to tell me not to eat mushrooms I found in the forest. He would say he could see me eating a poison mushroom and then getting sick and dying. He didn't really mean he could see it was going to happen, but that he feared for me. He was warning me what might happen if I ate mushrooms I didn't know. I understand, she said with a small smile. Was yours a true vision? Maybe it was a vision of something that's only possible. A vision of a danger, but not a certainty. It is true some visions are of things that are possible, but not yet settled in the fates. It could be that yours was that kind. Richard took up her hand in both of his. Do Shilu, he asked in a gentle voice. Please tell me now why you have come to me. She reverently smoothed the little colored strips running down her arm, as if reminding herself of the prayers her people sent with her. This was a woman who bore the mantle of responsibility with spirit, courage, and dignity. The Bakatao Mana are joyous to be in their homeland after all these generations separated from the place of our hearts. Our homeland is all the old words passed down said it was. The land is fertile, the weather favorable. It is a good place to raise our children, a place where we can be free. Our hearts sing to be there. Every people should have what you have given to us, Kaharin. Every people should be safe to live as they would. A terrible sorrow settled through her expression. You are not. You and your people of this land of the new world you told me about are not safe. A great army comes. Chagang, Richard breathed. You had a vision of this? No, my husband. We have seen it with our own eyes. I was ashamed to tell you of this, ashamed because we were so frightened by them, and I did not want to admit our fear. When I was chained to the wall, and I knew the Majendi would come any day to sacrifice me, I was not this frightened, because it was only me, not all my people, who would die. My people were strong, and they would get a new spirit woman to take my place. They would fight off the Majendi if they came into the swamp. I could die knowing the Bakaban Mana would live on. We practice every day with our weapons, so none may come and destroy us. We stand ready, as the old laws say, to do battle for our lives against any who would come against us. There is no man but the Kaharin who could face one of our blade masters. But no matter how good our blade masters, they could not fight an army like this. When they at last put their eye toward us, we would not be able to fight off this foe. I understand, Ushailu. Tell me what you saw. What I have seen, I have no way of telling you. I do not know how to tell you that you might understand how many men we have seen, how many horses, how many wagons, how many weapons. This army stretches from horizon to horizon for days as they pass. They are beyond count. I could no more tell you how many blades of grass are on these plains. I have no word that can express such a vast number. I think you just have, Richard murmured. They didn't attack your people then? No, they did not come through our homeland. Our fear for ourselves is but for the future. When these men decide to swallow us, men like this will not forever leave us to ourselves. 
Men like these take everything. There is never enough for them. Our men will all die. Our children will all be murdered. Our women will all be taken. We have no hope against this foe. You are the Kaharan, so you must be told these things. That is the old law. As spirit woman to the Bakatao Mana, I am ashamed that I must show you my fear and tell you our people are frightened. We will all perish in the teeth of this beast. I wish I could tell you we look with bravery to the jaws of death, but we do not. We look with trembling hearts. You are Kaharin. You would not know. You have no fear. Do Shai Lu, Richard said with a startled guffaw. I'm often afraid. You? Never. Her gaze withdrew to the blanket. You are just saying so that I might not be shamed. You have faced the thirty without fear and defeated them. Only the Gaharin could do such a thing. The Gaharin is fearless. Richard lifted her chin. I faced the thirty, but not without fear. I was terrified, as I am right now of the chimes and the war facing us. Admitting your fear is not a weakness, Du Shailu. She smiled at his kindness. Thank you, Kaharin. The Imperial Order didn't try to attack you then? For now we are safe. I came to warn you because they come into the new world. They passed us by. They come for you first. Richard nodded. They were headed north into the Midlands. General Rybish's army of nearly a hundred thousand men was marching east to guard the southern reaches of the Midlands. The general had asked Richard's permission not to return to Aidendrill, his plan being to watch the southern passes into the Midlands, and especially the back routes into Dahara. It made sense to Richard. Fortune now put the man and his Daharan army in Jagang's path. Rybish's force might not be large enough to take on the Imperial Order, but Daharans were fierce fighters and would be well placed to guard the passes north. Once they knew where Jagang's forces were going, more men could be sent to join Rybish's army. Jagang had gifted wizards and sisters in his army. General Rybish had a number of the Sisters of the Light with him, too. Sister Verna, Prelate Verna now, had given Richard her word that the Sisters would fight against the Order and the magic they used. Magic was now failing. But so would the magic of those aiding Jagang, except perhaps the Sisters of the Dark, and the wizards with them who knew how to conjure subtractive magic. General Rybish, as well as Richard and the other generals back in Aidendrill and Dahara, had been counting on the sisters to use their abilities to keep track of Jagang's army when it advanced into the New World, and with that knowledge, aid the Daharan forces in selecting an advantageous place to take a stand. Now, magic was failing, leaving them blind. Luckily, Du Shai Lu and the Bakatao Mana had kept the order from surprising them. This is a great help, Du Shai Lu, Richard smiled at her. It is important news you bring. Now we know what Jagang is doing. They didn't try to come through your land then? They simply passed you by? They would have had to go out of their way to attack us now. Because of their numbers, the edges of their army came near. But like a porcupine in the belly of a dog, our blade masters made it painful for them to brush against us. We captured some of the leaders of these dogs on two legs. They told us that for now their army was not interested in our small homeland and people, and they were content to pass us by. They hunt bigger game. But they will one day return and wipe the Bakatao Mana from the land. They told you their plans? Everyone will talk if asked properly, she smiled. The chimes are not the only ones to use fire. We, Richard held up his hand, I get the idea. They told us their army was going to a place that could provide them with supplies. Richard idly stroked his lower lip as he considered that important bit of news. That makes sense. They've been gathering their forces in the old world for some time. They can't stay put forever, not an army like that. An army has to be fed. An army that size would need to move and would need supplies. A lot of supplies. The new world would offer them a tempting meal along with their conquests. He looked up at Kalin, standing behind his left shoulder. Where would they likely go to find supplies? There are any number of places, Kalin said. They could pillage from each place as they invade, getting what they need as they strike deeper into the Midlands. As long as they pick their route with that in mind, they could feed the army as they go, like a bat scooping up bugs. Or they might strike at a place with larger stocks. Liffany, for example, could net them a lot of grain, Sandiria has vast sheep herds, 
and would get them meat. If they picked targets with enough food, they could supply their army for a long time to come, allowing them the freedom to pick their targets at will, for strategic reasons alone. We would have a difficult time of it. If I were them, that would be my plan. Without their urgent need for food, we would be at their mercy as far as picking a place to stand against them. We could use General Rybish, Richard said, thinking aloud. Maybe he could block the order, or at least slow them while we evacuate people and supplies before Jagang can get to them. That would be a huge task, moving so many supplies. If Rybish surprises Jagang's troops, Kalin said, also thinking aloud, engages him to stall their advance, and we could move enough other forces in from the sides. Du Shailu was shaking her head. When we were banished from our homeland by the lawgivers, she said, we were made to live in the wet place. When it rained to the north for many days, great floods came. The river overflowed its banks and spread wide. In its rush, churning with mud and big uprooted trees, it swept everything before it. We could not stand against the weight and fury of so much water. No one could. You think you can until you see it coming. You find higher ground or die. This army is like that. You cannot imagine how big it is. Seeing the burden of dread in her eyes and hearing the weight of her words made goose flesh rise on Richard's arms. Though she couldn't express the number, it was unimportant. He understood the concept as if she were somehow pouring her image and impressions of the imperial order directly into his mind. Du Shailu, thank you for bringing us this information. You may have saved a great many lives with your words. At least now we won't be caught unawares, as we might well have been. Thank you. General Rybish is already headed east, so we have that much in our favor, Kalin said. We must now get word to him, Richard nodded. We can take a roundabout way to Aden Drill so we can meet up with him and decide what to do next. Also, we can get horses from him. That would save us time in the long run. I only wish he wasn't so far away. Time is vital. After the battle in which the Daharan army had defeated Jagang's huge expeditionary force, Rybish had turned his army and was racing east. The Daharans were returning to guard the routes north from the Old World, where Jagang had gathered his forces in preparation for marching into the Midlands or possibly Dahara. If we can get to the general and warn him Jagang's army is coming, Kara offered, then we could get his messengers sent off to Dahara to call reinforcements. And to Kelton, Jara, and Grenadon, among others, Kalin said. We have a number of lands with standing armies already on our side. Richard nodded. That makes sense. We'll know where they're needed, at least. I just wish we could get to Aden Drill faster. Are we sure it really even makes any difference now? Kalin asked. Remember, it's the chimes, not the lurk. What Zed asked us to do may not help, Richard said. But then again, we don't know that for sure, do we? He might have been telling us the truth about the urgency of what we need to do, but simply cloaked it with the name Lurk instead of Chimes. We could lose to Jagang before the Chimes can get us. Dead is dead. Kalin let out a frustrated sigh. I don't know Zed's game, but the truth would have served us in better stead. We must get to Aiden Drill, Richard said with finality. That's all there is to it. His sword was in Aiden Drill. In much the same way Kara could sense him by her bond, and Du Shailu could tell where he was, Richard had been named Seeker and was connected to the Sword of Truth. He was bonded to the blade. He felt as if something inside him was missing without it. Du Shailu, Richard asked, when this great army went past you on its way north, I never said they went north. Richard blinked. But that's where they would have to be going. They're coming up into the Midlands or else Dahara. They would have to come north for either. Du Shailu shook her head emphatically. No, they are not going north. They went past our land on our south side, staying near the shore, turning with it, and now go west. Richard stared dumbfounded. West? Kalin sank to her knees beside him. Du Shailu, are you sure? Yes, we shadowed them. We had men scout in all directions because my visions warned me these men were a great danger to the Kaharan. Some of the men of rank we captured knew the name Richard Rall. That is why I had to come to warn you. This army knows you by name. You have dealt them blows and frustrated their plans. They have great hate for you. Their men told us these things. 
Could your visions of me and fire really be the fire of hatred these men have in their hearts for me? Du Shailu mulled over his question. You understand visions, my husband. It could be as you say. A vision does not always mean what it shows. It sometimes means only this thing is possible and a danger that must be watched, and it sometimes is as you say, a vision of an impression of an idea, not an event. Kalin reached out and snatched Du Shailu's sleeve. But where are they going? Somewhere they will turn north into the Midlands. Lives are at stake. Did you find out where? We must know where they will turn to the north. No, Du Shailu said, looking befuddled by their surprise. They plan on following the shoreline with a great water. The ocean? Kalin asked. Yes, that was their name for it. They intend to follow the great water and go to the west. The men did not know what the place they go is called, only that they are to go far to the west, to a land that has, as you said, vast supplies of food. Kalin let go of the woman's sleeve. Dear spirits, she whispered, we are in trouble. I'd say so, Richard said as he clenched a fist. General Rybish is far off to the east and running in the wrong direction. Worse, Kalin said as she turned to look southwest, as if she could see where the order was headed. Of course, Richard breathed. That's the land Zed was talking about, near that Narif Valley place, the isolated land to the southwest of here that grows so much grain, right? Yes, Kalin said, still staring off to the horizon. Jagang is headed for the breadbasket of the Midlands. Toskla, Richard said, remembering what Zed had called it. Kalin turned back to him, nodding in resigned frustration. It looks that way, she said. I never thought Jagang would go that far out of the way. I would have expected him to strike quickly into the new world, so as not to allow us time to gather our forces. That's what I was expecting. General Rybish thought so too. He's racing to guard a gate Jagang isn't going to use. Richard tapped a finger against his knee as he considered their options. At least it may buy us time. And now we know where the Imperial Order is going, Toskla. Kaelin shook her head, she too seeming to be considering the options. Zed knew the place by an old name. The name of that land has changed over time. It's been known as Vengrin, Vendice, and Terslin, among others. It hasn't been known as Toskla for quite some time. Oh, Richard said, not really listening as he started making a mental list of things they had to weigh. So, what's it called now? Now it's Anderith, she said. Richard's head came up. He felt a tingling, icy wave ripple up through his thighs. Anderith? Why? Why is it called Anderith? Kalin's brow twitched at the look on his face. It was named after one of their ancient founders. His name was Ander. The tingling sensation raced the rest of the way up Richard's arms and back. Ander. He blinked at her. Joseph Ander? How do you know that? The wizard called the mountain? The one Kolo said they sent to deal with the chimes? Kalin nodded. That was his cognomen, what everyone called him. His real name was Joseph Ander. Chapter 32 Richard felt as if his thoughts were going to war in his head. At the same time that he groped for solutions to the spectral threat, he was assailed by the image of endless enemy soldiers pouring up from the old world. All right, he said holding his hand out to stop everyone from talking at once. All right, slow down. Let's just reason this out. The whole world might be dead from the chimes before Jagang can conquer the Midlands, Kalin said. We need to address the chimes above all else. You're the one who convinced me of that. It's not just that the world of life might very well need magic to survive, but we need magic to counter Jagang. He would like nothing better than for us to have to battle him by sword alone. We must get to Aidendril. As you yourself said, what if Zed was telling the truth about what we need to do at the Wizard's Keep, with that bottle? If we fail to carry out our charge, we may aid the Chimes in taking over the world of life. If we don't act soon enough, it may forever be too late. And I need my Agile to work again, Kara said with painful impatience, or I can't protect you both as I need to. I say we must go to Aidendril and stop the Chimes. Richard looked from one woman to the other. Fine. But how are we going to stop the chimes if Zed's task is only a fool's journey to keep us out of his way? 
What if he's just worried and wants us out of harm's way while he tries to deal with the problem himself? You know, like a father, when he sees a suspicious stranger approaching, might tell his children to run into the house because he needs them to count the sticks of firewood in the bin. Richard watched both their faces sour with frustration. I mean, it's a good piece of information that Joseph Ander was the one sent to stop the chimes, and he's the same one who founded this land of Andereth. Maybe it means something, and maybe Zed wasn't aware of it. I'm not saying we should go to Andereth. The spirits know I want to get to Aidendrill, too. I just want not to overlook something important. Richard pressed his fingers to his temples. I don't know what to do. Then we should go to Aidendrill, Kalen said. We know that at least has a chance. Richard reasoned it through aloud. That might be best. After all, what if the mountain, Joseph Ander, stopped the chimes way in the opposite direction, at the other end of the Midlands, and afterwards, later in life, after the war or something, went on to establish this land, now called Andereth? Right. Then we must get to Aidendrill as soon as possible, Kalin insisted, and hope it will stop the chimes. Look, Richard said holding up a finger to ask for patience. I agree, but what are we going to do to stop the chimes if it's all for naught? If it's part of Zed's trick, then we have done nothing to stop either threat. We must consider that too. Lord Rall, Kara weighed in, going to Aidendril would still be a value. Not only could you get your sword and try what Zed asked of you, but you would also have Kolo's journal. Berdine is there, she can help you with translating it. She would be working on it while we have been gone. She may have already translated more about the chimes. She may have answers sitting there waiting for you to see them. If not, you will have the book, and you know what to search for. That's true, Richard said. There are other books at the keep, too. Colo said the chimes turned out to be much simpler to counter than they all thought. But they all had subtractive magic, Kalin pointed out. Richard did, too but he knew precious little about using it. The sword was the only thing he really understood. Perhaps one of the books in the wizard's keep has the solution to dealing with the chimes, Kara said, and maybe it isn't complicated. Maybe it doesn't take subtractive magic. The moored Sith folded her arms with obvious distaste at the thought of magic. Maybe you can stir your finger in the air and proclaim them gone. Yes, you are a magic man. Du Shailu offered, not realizing Kara had been exercising her sarcastic wit. You could do that. You give me more credit than I deserve, he said to Du Shailu. It still sounds like our only real option is to go to Aidendril, Kalin said. Unsure, Richard shook his head. He wished it weren't so hard to decide the right thing to do. He was balanced on a divide, leaning first one way and then the other. He wished he had some other bit of information that would tip the balance. Sometimes he just wished he could scream that he was only a woods guide and didn't know what to do, and have someone who did step in and make everything look simple. Sometimes he felt like an imposter in his role as Lord Rall, and felt like simply giving up and going home to Westland. Now was one of those times. He wished Zed hadn't lied to him. Lives now hung in the balance because they didn't know the truth and because Richard had not used Zed's wisdom when he had the chance. If only he had used his head and remembered Du Shailu. Why are you against going to Aidendril? Kalin asked. I wish I knew, Richard said. But we do know where Jagang is going. We need to do something about it. If he conquers the Midlands, we'll be dead, beyond doing anything about the chimes. He started pacing. What if the chimes aren't as big a threat as we fear? I mean, in the long run, yes, of course, but what if they take years to bring about the erosion of magic that would cause any real harm, irreversible harm? For all we know, it could take centuries. Richard, what's wrong with you? They're killing people now. Kalin gestured back across the grasslands toward the mud people's village. They killed Juni. They killed some of the Bakatal Mana. We have to do whatever we can to stop them. You're the one who convinced me of this. Lord Rall, Kara said. I agree with the Mother Confessor. We must go to Aidendril. Du Shailu stood. May I speak, Kaharin? Richard looked up from his thoughts. Yes, of course. She was about to do so when she paused with her mouth open. A puzzled expression came over her face. This man who leads them, this Jagang, he is a magic man? Yes. Well, in a way. 
He has the ability to enter the minds of people and in that way control them. He's called a dream walker. He has no other magic, though. Du Shailu considered his words a moment. An army cannot long persevere without the support of the people of their land. He controls all the people of his land, then, in this way? Everyone on his side? No, he can't do this with everyone at once. He must pick who he will take. Much like a blade master in a battle would first pick the most important targets. He picks those with magic and controls them in order to use their magic to his advantage. So the witches then are forced to do his evil? With their magic they hold his people by their throat? No, Kalin said from behind Richard. The people submit willingly. Du Shailu looked dubious. You believe people would choose to allow such a man to be their leader? Tyrants can only rule by the consent of their people. Then they are bad people too, not just him? They are people like any other, Kalin said. Like hounds at a feast, people gather round the table of tyranny, eager for tasty scraps tossed on the floor. Not everyone will wag their tail for a tyrant, but most will, if he first makes them salivate with hate and gives license to their covetous impulses by making them feel it is only their due. Many would rather take than earn. Tyrants make the envious comfortable with their greed. Jackals, Du Shailu said. Jackals, Kalin agreed. Disturbed at hearing such a thing, Du Shailu's eyes turned down. That makes it more horrible then. I would rather think these people possessed by this man's magic or the keeper himself than to think they would follow such a beast of their own will. You were going to say something? Richard asked. You said you wanted to say something. I'd like to hear it. Du Shailu clasped her hands before herself. Her look of dismay was overcome by a yet graver expression. On our way here, we shadowed the army to see where they went. We also captured some of their men to be sure. This army travels very slowly. Their leader, each night, has his tents put up for him and his women. The tents are big enough to hold many people and have many accommodations for his comfort. They also put up other tents for other important men. Each night is a feast. Their leader, Jagang, is like a great and wealthy king on a journey. Page 232. They have wagons of women. Some willing, some not. At night, all are passed around among the soldiers. This army is driven by lust for pleasure as well as conquest. They tend well to their pleasures as they go in search of conquest. They have much equipment. They have many extra horses. They have herds of meat on the hoof. Long trains of wagons carry food and other supplies of every kind. They have wagons with everything from flour mills to blacksmith forges. They bring tables and chairs, carpets, fine plates and glassware they pack in shavings in wooden boxes. Each night they unpack it all and make Jagang's tents like a palace, surrounded by the houses of his important men. With their big tents and all the comforts they carry with them, it is almost like a city that travels. Du Shailu glided the flat of her hand through the air. This army moves like a slow river. It takes its time, but nothing stops it. It keeps coming, every day a little more, a city sliding across the land. They are many, and they are slow, but they come. I knew I must warn the Kaharin, so we did not want to shadow these men any longer. She turned the hand in the air, like dust stirring before a high wind. We return to our swift travel. The Baka Taumana can travel as swiftly on foot as men on running horses. Richard had traveled with her. It was a false boast, but not by much. He had once made her ride a horse. She thought it an evil beast. As we made swift journey northwest across this vast and open land to come here, we arrived unexpectedly at a great city with high walls. That would be Renwald, Kalin said. It's the only big city in the wilds anywhere near your route here. It has the walls you describe. Du Shailu nodded. Renwald, we did not know its name. Her intense gaze, like that of a queen with grave news, moved from Kalin to Richard. They had been visited by the army of this man, Jagang. Du Shailu stared off, as if seeing it again. I have never thought people could be that cruel to others. The Majendi, as much as we hated them, would not do such things as these men did to the people there. 
Tears welled in Du Chailu's eyes, finally overflowing to run down her cheeks. They butchered the people there, the old, the young, the babies, but not before they spent days. Du Chailu's sob broke loose. Kalin put an understanding arm around the woman's shoulder. Du Chailu seemed suddenly a child in Kalin's embrace, a child who had seen too much. I know, Kalin soothed, near tears along with Du Chailu. I know. I too have been to a great walled city where men who followed Jagang had been. I know the things you've seen. I have walked among the dead inside the walls of Ebenissia. I have seen the slaughter at the hands of the Order. I have seen what these beasts first did to the living. Du Shailu, the woman who led her people with grit and guts, who had faced with defiance and courage months of capture and the prospect of her imminent sacrifice, who watched her husbands die to fulfill the laws she kept, who willingly confronted death to help Richard destroy the Towers of Perdition in the hope of returning her people to their land, buried her face in Kalin's shoulder and wept like a child at recalling what she had seen in Renwald. The Blade Masters turned away rather than see their spirit woman so heartsick. Chandelin and his hunters, waiting not far off for everyone to finish with their deliberations, also turned away. Richard wouldn't have thought anything could bring Du Chailu to tears in front of others. There was a man there, Du Chailu said between sobs. The only one we could find still alive. How did he survive? It sounded pretty far-fetched to Richard. Did he say? He was crazy. He wailed to the good spirits for his family. He cried endlessly for what he said was his folly and asked the spirits to forgive him and return his loved ones. He carried the rotting head of a child. He talked to it as if it were alive, begging its forgiveness. Kalin's face took on a saddened aspect. Slowly, with apparent reluctance, she said, Did he have long white hair? A red coat with gold braiding at the shoulders? You know him? Du Chailu asked. Ambassador Selden, he didn't live through the attack. He wasn't there when it came. He was in Aidendrill. Kalin looked up at Richard. I asked him to join us. He refused, saying he believed the same as the Assembly of Seven, that his land of Mardovia would be vulnerable if they joined with one side or the other. He refused to join us or the Order, saying they believed neutrality was their safety. What did you tell him? Richard asked. Your words. Your decree that there are no bystanders in this war. I told him that his mother confessor I have decreed no mercy against the Order. I told Ambassador Selden we were of one mind in this, you and I, and that his land was either with us or stood against us, and that the Imperial Order would view it the same way. I tried to tell him what would happen. He wouldn't listen. I begged him to consider the lives of his family. He said they were safe behind the walls of Renwald. I wouldn't wish that lesson on anyone, Richard whispered. Du Chailu sobbed anew. I pray the head was not his own child. I wish I did not see it in my dreams. Richard's touch was gentle on Du Chailu's arm. We understand, Du Chailu. The Order's terror is a calculated means of demoralizing future victims, of intimidating them into surrender. This is why we fight these people. Du Chailu looked up at him, wiping her cheek with the back of her hand as she sniffed back the tears. Then I ask you to go to this place the Order goes to, or at least send someone to warn them. Have the people there flee before they are tortured and butchered like those we saw in this place, Renwald. These Ander people must be warned. They must flee. Her tears returned, accompanied by racking sobs. Richard watched as she wandered off into the grass to weep in private. Richard felt Kalin's hand settle on his shoulder and turned back. This land, Andereth, hasn't surrendered to us yet. They had representatives in Aidendrill to hear our side of it, didn't they? They know our position? Yes, Kalin said. Their representatives were warned the same as those of other lands. They were told of the threat and that we mean to stand against it. Andereth knows the alliance of the Midlands is a thing of the past, and we expect the surrender of their sovereignty to the Daharan Empire. Daharan Empire. The word seemed so harsh, so cold. Here he was a woods guide, 
feeling like an imposter on some throne he wasn't even sure existed, except in title, responsible for an empire. Not that long ago, I was terrified of Dahara. I feared they would have all the lands. Now that's our only hope. Kalin smiled at the irony. Its name, Dahara, is the only thing the same, Richard. Most people know you fight for people's freedom, not their enslavement. Tyranny now wears the iron cloak of the Imperial Order. Andreth knows the terms, the same as we've given every land, that if they join us willingly, they will be one people with us, entitled to the same equal and honest treatment as everyone, and governed by fair and just laws we all obey. They know there are no exceptions. And they know the sanctions and consequences should they fail to join us. Renwald was told the same, he reminded her. They didn't believe us. Not all are willing to face the truth. We can't expect it, and must concern ourselves with those who share our conviction to fight for freedom. You can't sacrifice good people, Richard, and risk a just cause for those who will not see. To do that would be a betrayal to those with brave hearts who have joined us, and to whom you are responsible. You're right. Richard released a pent-up sigh. He felt the same, but it was a comfort to hear it from her. Does Andereth have a large army? Well, yes, Kalin said. But the real defense for Andereth is not their army. It's a weapon called the Domini Dirch. While he thought the name sounded like High Daharan, with everything else on his mind, the translation didn't immediately spring to mind. Is it something we can use to stop the order? Staring off deep in thought as she considered his question, Kalin plucked the tops of the grass. It's an ancient weapon of magic. With the Domini Dirch, Andereth has always been virtually immune to attack. They are part of the Midlands because they need us as trading partners need a market for the vast quantities of food they grow. But with the Domini Dirch, they're nearly autonomous, almost outside the Alliance of the Midlands. It's always been a tenuous relationship. As Mother Confessors before me, I forced them to accept my authority and abide by the rulings of the Council if they were to sell their goods. Still, the Anders are a proud people and always thought of themselves as separate, better than others. That's what they may think, but not what I think, and not what Jagang will think. So what about this weapon? Could it stop the Imperial Order, do you think? Well, it hasn't had to be used on a big scale for centuries. Kaylin brushed the head of a stalk of grass across her chin as she thought it over. But I can't imagine why not. Its effectiveness discourages any attack, at least in ordinary times. Since the last large conflict, it's only been used in relatively minor troubles. What is this protection? Kara asked. How does it work? The Domini Dirch is a string of defense not far in from their borders with the wilds. It's a line of huge bells, spaced far apart, but within sight of one another. They stand guard across the entire Andereth frontier. Bells, Richard said. How do these bells protect them? You mean they're used to warn people? To call their troops? Kaylin waved her stalk of grass the way an instructor might wave a switch to dissuade a student from getting the wrong idea. Zed used to wave his finger in much the same way, adding that impish smile so as not to give Richard a harsh impression as he was being corrected. Kaylin, though, was not correcting but schooling, and as far as the Midlands were concerned, Richard was still very much a student. The word schooling stuck in his head as soon as it crossed his mind. Not that kind of bell, Kalin said. They don't really look much like bells other than their shape. They're carved from stone that over the ages has become encrusted with lichen and such. They are like ancient monuments, terrible monuments. Jutting up as they do from the soil of the plains, marching off in a line to the horizon, they almost look like the vertebra of some huge, dead, endlessly long monster. Richard scratched his jaw in wonder. How big are they? They stand up above the grass and wheat on these fat stone pedestals, maybe eight or ten feet across. She passed her hand over her head. The pedestals are about as tall as we are. Steps going up the bell itself are cut into each base. The bells are, I don't know, eight, nine feet tall, including the carriage. The back of each bell, carved as part of the same stone, is round, 
like a shield, or a little like a wall lamp might have a reflector behind it. The Andereth army mans each bell at all times. When an enemy approaches, the soldier, when given the order, stands behind the shield, and the Domini Dirch, these bells, are then struck with a long wooden striker. They emit a very deep knell, at least behind the Domini Dirch it's said to be a deep knell. No one attacking has ever lived to say what it sounds like from that side, from the death zone. Richard had gone from simple wonder to astonishment. What do the bells do to the attackers? What does this sound do? Kaylin rolled the heads of the grass in her fingers, crumbling them. It sloughs the flesh right off the bones. Richard couldn't even imagine such a horrific thing. Is this a legend, do you think? Or do you know it to be a fact? I once saw the results. Some primitive people from the wilds, intent on a raid as retribution for harm to one of their women by an Andereth soldier. She shook her head despondently. It was a grisly sight, Richard. A pile of bloody bones in the middle of a... a gory heap. You could see hair in it, parts of scalp, and the clothes. I saw some fingernails and the whorled flesh from a fingertip, but I could recognize little else. Except for those few bits and the bones, you wouldn't even know it had been human. That would leave no doubt. The bells use magic, Richard said. How far out does it kill, and how quickly? As I understand it, the Domini Dirch kill every person in front of them for about as far as the eye can see. Once they're rung, an invader takes only a step or two before their skin undergoes catastrophic ruptures. Muscle and flesh begin coming away from bone. Their insides, hearts, lungs, everything, drops from under the rib cage as their intestines all give way. There is no defense. Once begun, all before the Domini Dirch die. Can an invader sneak up at night? Richard asked. Kaylin shook her head. The land is flat, so the defenders are able to see for miles. At night, torches can be lit. Additionally, a trench extends in front of the entire line, so no one can crawl up unseen through the grass or wheat. As long as the line of Domini Dirch is manned, there's no way to get past it. At least it has been thousands of years since anyone has gotten past. Does the number of invaders matter? From what I know of it, the Domini Dirch could kill any number gathered together and march toward Andereth, toward those stone bells, as long as the defending soldiers kept ringing them. Like an army, Richard whispered to himself. Richard, I know what you're thinking. But with the chimes loose, magic is failing. It would be a foolhardy risk to depend on the Domini Dirch to stop Jagang's army. Richard watched Du Shai Lu off in the grass, her head in her hands as she wept. But you said Andreth also has a large army. Kalin sighed impatiently. Richard, you promised Zed we would go to Aidendril. I did, but I didn't promise him when. You implied it. He turned back to face her. It wouldn't break the promise to go somewhere else first. Richard! Kalin, maybe with magic failing, Jagang sees this as his chance to successfully invade Andereth and capture its stores of food. That would be bad for us. But the Midlands has other sources of food. And what if food isn't the only reason Jagang is going to Andereth? He cocked an eyebrow. He has people with the gift. They would know as well as Zed and Anne that magic was failing. What if they could figure out it was the chimes? What if Jagang saw this as his chance to take a formerly invincible land, and then, if things change, if the chimes are banished? He would have no way of knowing it was the chimes. But even if he did, how could he know what to do to banish them? He has some gifted people with him, gifted from the palace of the prophets. Those men and women have studied the books in the vaults there. For hundreds of years they've studied those books. I can't imagine how much they know, can you? The emerging possibilities and implications etched alarm into Kalin's face. You think they may have a way to banish the chimes? I have no idea, but if they did, or went to Andereth and there uncovered the solution, think about what it would mean. Jagang's army, en masse, would be in the Midlands, behind the Domini Dirch, and there wouldn't be anything we could do to rout them. At their will, they could, where and when they wish, charge into the Midlands. 
Andereth is a big land. With the Domini Dirch in his control, we would be unable to scout beyond the border, and so would have no idea where his troops were massing. We couldn't possibly begin to guard the entire border, yet his spies would be able to sneak out to detect where our armies waited and then slip back in to report to Jagang. He could then race out through holes in a net spread too thin and drive his attack into the Midlands. If need be, they could strike a blow and then withdraw back behind the Domini Dirch. If he used just a little planning and patience, he could wait until he found a weak place, with our troops too distant to respond in time, and then his entire army could roar through gaps in our lines and into the Midlands. Once past our forces, they could rampage virtually unchecked, with us only able to nip at their heels as we chased after them. Once ensconced behind the stone curtain of the Domini Dirch, time would be on his side. He could wait a week, a month, a year. He could wait ten years until we became dull and weak from bearing the weight of constant vigilance. Then he could suddenly burst out upon us. Dear spirits, Kalin whispered. She gave him a sharp look. This is all just speculation. What if they don't really have a way to banish the chimes? I don't know, Kalin. I'm just saying what if. We have to decide what to do. If we decide wrong, we could lose it all. Kalin let out a breath. You're right about that. Richard turned and watched Du Shailu kneel down. Her hands were folded, her head bowed, in what looked to be earnest prayer. Does Andereth have any books, any libraries? Well, yes, Kalin said. They have a huge library of culture, as they call it. Richard lifted an eyebrow. If there is an answer, why does it have to be in Aidendril, in Kolo's journal? What if the answer, if there is one, is in their library? If there really is an answer in some book. Wearily, Kaylin gripped a handful of her long hair hanging down over her shoulder. Richard, I agree that all of this is worrisome, but we have a duty to others to act responsibly. Lives, nations are at stake. If it came down to a sacrifice of one land to save the rest, I would reluctantly and with great sorrow leave that land to their fate while I did my duty to the greater number. Zed told us we had to get to Aidendril in order to reverse the problem. He may have called it by another name, but the problem is much the same. If doing as he asked will stop the chimes, then we must do it. We have a duty to act in our best judgment to the benefit of all. I know. The millstone of responsibility could be unnerving. They needed to go both places. There's just something about this whole thing that's bothering me, and I can't figure it out. Worse, I fear the lives it will cost if we make the wrong choice. Her fingers closed around his arm. I know, Richard. He threw up his hands and turned away. I really need to take a look at that book, Mountain's Twin. But didn't Anne say she wrote in her journey book to Verna, and Verna said it had been destroyed? Yes, so there's no way... Richard spun back to her. Journey book. A flash of realization ignited. Kalen, the journey books are how the sisters communicate when one goes on a long journey away from the others. Yes, I know. The journey books were made for them by the wizards of old, back in the time of the Great War. Her face twisted with a puzzled frown. And? Richard made himself blink. The books are paired. You can only communicate with the twin of the one you have. Richard... I don't see what if the wizards used to do the same thing. The wizards keep in Aidendril was always sending wizards off on missions. What if that's how they knew what was going on everywhere? How they coordinated everything? What if they used them just like the Sisters of the Light used them? After all, wizards of that time created the spell around the Palace of the Prophets and created the journey books for the Sisters to use. She was frowning. I'm still not sure I understand... Richard gripped her shoulders. What if the book that was destroyed, Mountain's Twin, is a journey book? The twin to Joseph Anders' journey book. Chapter 33 Kalin was speechless. Richard squeezed her shoulders. What if the other, Joseph Anders' half of that pair, still exists? She wet her lips. It's possible they might keep something like that in Andereth. They must. They revere him. After all, they named their land in his honor. 
It seems only logical that if it still existed, they would keep such a book. It's possible. But that isn't always the way, Richard. What do you mean? Sometimes a person isn't appreciated in his own time. Sometimes they aren't recognized as important until much later. And sometimes then only to promote the contemporary causes of those currently in power. Evidence of a person's true thoughts can be an inconvenience in such cases, and sometimes is destroyed. Even if that isn't the case, and they did respect his thinking, the land changed its name to Andereth since Zed left the Midlands. Sometimes people are revered because not enough remains of their philosophy for people to find objectionable, and so the person can become valuable as a symbol. Most likely nothing of Joseph Anders remains. Taken aback by the logic of her words, Richard rubbed his chin as he considered. The other unknown, he finally said, is that words written in journey books can be wiped away to make room for new communications. Even if everything I'm thinking is true, and he wrote back to the keep with the solution to the chimes, the book still exists, and it's actually in Andereth, it still might do us no good, because that passage could easily have been wiped clean to make room for a future message. But, he added, it's the only solid possibility we have. No, it isn't, Kalin insisted. Another choice, and the one with more weight of credibility on its side, is what we must do back at the wizard's keep. Richard felt himself drawn inexorably toward Joseph Anders' legacy. If he had any proof that his attraction to it wasn't simply his imagination, he would have been convinced. Kalin, I know... His voice trailed off. The hairs at the back of his neck began rising, prickling his neck like needles of ice. His golden cloak lifted lethargically in the lazy breeze. The slow wave billowing through it cracked like a whip when it reached the corner. The skin on his arms danced with goose flesh. Richard felt the gossamer fingers of wickedness slipping up his spine. What's the matter? Kalin asked, consternation chilling her expression. Without answering, gripped by dread, he turned and scanned the grassland. Emptiness stared back. Verdant waves rippled before him, painted with bold strokes of sunlight. In the distance, knots of dark clouds at the horizon boiled from within with flickering light. Even though he couldn't hear the thunder, every now and again he could feel the drumbeat underfoot. Where's Du Shailu? Kara, standing a few paces away as she kept an eye on the idle men, pointed. I saw her off that way a few minutes ago. Richard searched, but didn't see her. Doing what? She was crying. Then I think she looked like she might have been going to sit down for a rest, or maybe to pray. That was what Richard had seen, too. He called out Du Shailu's name over the grasslands. In the distance, a meadowlark's crystalline song warbled across the vast silence of the plains. He cupped his hands behind his mouth and called again. The blade masters, when there was no answer the second time, sprang to action, fanning out into the grass to search. Richard trotted off in the direction Kara had pointed, the direction he, too, remembered last seeing her. Kalin and Kara were right on his heels as he picked up speed, cutting through the tall grass and splashing through puddles. The blade masters and hunters searched as they ran, and with no reply as all called Du Shailu's name, their search became frantic. The grass, a singular, undulating, sentient thing alive with mocking contempt, teased them with bowing nods to draw the eye first here and then there, hinting but never divulging where it hid her. Out of the side of his vision, Richard caught sight of a dark shape, distinct from the mellow green of new grass rising and falling above the washed-out tan of the lifeless stalks beneath the waves. He cut to the right, muddling leadenly through a spongy area where the mat of grass, as if it floated on a sea of mud, kept giving way beneath his feet. The ground firmed. He spotted the out-of-place dark shape and altered his course slightly as he splashed through an expanse of standing water. Richard came suddenly upon her. Du Shailu reposed in the grass, looking like she might be sleeping, her dress smoothed down to the backs of her knees, her legs below it a pasty white. She was face down in water, only inches deep. Racing through the wet grass, Richard dove over her to avoid falling on her. He snatched the shoulders of her dress and yanked her back, rolling her onto her back on the grass beside him. The front of her sodden dress plastered itself across her pronounced pregnancy. Strings of wet hair lay across her bloodless face. 
Du Shailu stared up with dark, dead eyes. She had that same odd, lingering look of lust in her eyes Junie had had when Richard found him drowned in the shallow stream. Richard shook her limp body. No! Du Shailu! No, I saw you alive only a minute ago! You can't be dead! Du Shailu! Her mouth slack, her arms splayed clumsily, she exhibited no response. There was no response to show. She was gone. When Kalin put a comforting hand on his shoulder, he fell back with an angry cry of anguish. She was just alive, Kara said. I just saw her alive only moments ago. Richard buried his face in his hands. I know. Dear spirits, I know. If only I'd realized what was happening. Kara pulled his hands away from his face. Lord Rawl, her spirit might still be with her body. Blade masters and mud people hunters were tumbling to their knees all around. Richard shook his head. I'm sorry, Kara, but she's gone. Stark, taunting memories of her alive cavorted unbidden through his mind. Lord Rawl, she's not breathing, Kara. He reached to close her eyes. She's dead. Kara gave his wrist a fierce tug. Did Denna not teach you? A Mord Sith would teach her captive to share the breath of life. Richard grimaced away from Kara's blue eyes. It was a gruesome rite, the sharing of pain in that way. The memory flooded through him with horror to match that of Du Shailu's death. A Mord Sith shared her victim's breath while he was on the cusp of death. It was a sacred thing to a Mord Sith to share his pain, share his breath of life as he slipped to the brink of death as if to view with lust the forbidden sight of what lies beyond in the next world. Sharing, when the time came to kill him, his very death by experiencing his final breath of life. Before Richard killed his mistress in order to escape, she had asked him to share her last breath of life. Richard had honored her last wish, and had taken into himself Denna's last breath as she died. Kara, I don't know what that has to do with... Give it back to her! Richard could only stare. What? Kara growled and stiff-armed him out of her way. She dropped down beside the body and put her mouth over Du Shailu's. Richard was horrified by what Kara was doing. He thought he had managed to give the Mord Sith more respect for life than this. The sight staggered him with the obscene memory, seeing it new again before his eyes, seeing her crave that corrupt intimacy again. It stunned him to see Kara covet something so ghastly from her past. It angered him she had not risen above her brutal training and way of life, as he had hoped for her. Pinching Du Shailu's nose, Kara blew a breath into the dead woman. Richard reached for Kara's broad shoulders to rip her away from Du Shailu. It enraged him to see it, to see a moored Sith do such a thing to the freshly dead. He paused, his hands floating there above her. Something in Kara's urgency in her demeanor, told him all was not what it had at first seemed. With one hand under Du Shailu's neck and the other holding her nose closed, Kara blew another breath. Du Shailu's chest rose with it and then slowly sank again as Kara took another for herself. A blade master, his face red with rage, reached for Kara, since Richard seemed to have changed his mind. Richard caught the man's wrist. He met John's questioning eyes and simply shook his head. Reluctantly, John withdrew. Richard, Kalin whispered, what in the world is she doing? Why would she do such a grotesque thing? Is it some kind of Daharan ritual for the dead? Kara took a deep breath and blew it into Du Shailu. I don't know, Richard whispered back, but it's not what I thought. Kalin looked even more bewildered. And what could you have possibly thought? Unwilling to put such a thing into words, he could only stare into her green eyes. He could hear Kara blow another deep breath into Du Shailu's lifeless corpse. He turned away, unable to watch. He couldn't understand what good Kara thought she was doing, but he couldn't sit there while others watched. He tried to convince himself that, as Kalin had suggested, perhaps it was some Daharan ritual to the departing spirit. Richard staggered to his feet. Kalin caught his hand. He heard a wet, sputtering cough. Richard swung back around and saw Kara hauling Du Shailu over onto her side. Du Shailu gasped with a choking breath. Kara slapped the woman's back as if she were burping a baby, but with more force. 
Du Shailu coughed and gasped and panted. Then she threw up. Richard fell to his knees and held her thick mass of dark hair out of her way as she vomited. Kara, what did you do? Richard was dumbfounded to see a dead woman come back to life. How did you do that? Kara thumped Du Shailu's back, making her cough out more water. Did Denna not teach you to share the breath of life? She sounded annoyed. Yes, but, but it wasn't. Du Shailu clutched at Richard's arm as she panted and spat up more water. Richard stroked her hair and back in a comforting manner to let her know they were there with her. The squeeze on his arm told him she knew. Kara, Kaelin asked, what have you done? How did you bring her back from death? Was it magic? Magic, Kara scoffed. No, not magic, not anything near magic. Her spirit had not yet left her body, that's all. Sometimes, if their spirit has not had time to leave their body, you still have time. But it must be done immediately. If so, you can sometimes give them back the breath of life. The men gestured wildly as they all jibber-jabbered excitedly to one another. They had just witnessed a marvel that was sure to be the birth of a legend. Their spirit woman had traveled to the world of the dead and returned. Richard stared slack-jawed at Kara. You can? You can give dead people back the breath of life? Kaylin whispered encouragement as she picked wet strands of hair from Du Shailu's face. She had to stop and hold back the hair when the woman's coughing was interrupted by another bout of heaving. As grim and sick as Du Shailu looked, she was breathing better. Kaylin took a blanket the men handed down and wrapped it around Du Shailu's shivering shoulders. Kara leaned close to Richard so no one else would hear. How do you think Denna kept you from death for so long when she tortured you? There was no one better at it than Denna. I am Mord Sith. I know what would have been done to you, and I knew Denna. There would have been times she had to do this to you to keep you from dying when she was not yet finished with you. But it would have been blood, not water. Richard remembered that, too, coughing up frothy blood as if he were drowning in it. Denna was Dark and Rawl's favorite, because she was the best. It was said she could keep her captive alive and on the cusp of death longer than any other Mord Sith. This was part of how she did that. But I never thought, Kara frowned. You never thought what? Richard shook his head. I never thought such a thing was possible. Not after the person had died. After she had just done something noble, he didn't have the heart to tell Kara he had thought she was sating some grisly appetite from her past. You did a miraculous thing, Kara. I'm proud of you. Kara scowled. Lord Rawl, stop looking at me like I am a great spirit come to our world. I am Mord Sith. Any Mord Sith could have done this. We all know how. She snatched his shirt collar and pulled him closer. You know of it too. Denna taught you, I know she did. You could have done this as easily as I. I don't know, Kara. I've only taken the breath of life. I've never given it. She released his collar. It is the same thing, just in the other direction. Du Shailu sprawled herself across Richard's lap. He smoothed her hair with gentle empathy. She clutched at his belt, his shirt, his waist, holding on for dear life as he tried to keep her calm. My husband she managed between gasping and coughing. You saved me from the kiss of death. Kaylin was holding one of Du Shailu's hands. Richard took the other and placed it on a leg sheathed in leather. Kara is the one who saved you, Du Shailu. Kara gave you back the breath of life. Du Shailu's fingers kneaded at Kara's leather-clad leg, groping their way up until she found Kara's hand. And the Kaharin's baby, you saved us both. Thank you, Kara. She gasped another rattling breath. Richard's child will live because of you. Thank you. Richard didn't think it the proper time to point out paternity. It was nothing. Lord Rawl would have done it, but I was closer and beat him to it. Kara briefly squeezed the hand before standing to make way for some of the grateful blade masters to get close to their spirit woman. Thank you, Kara, Du Shailu repeated. Kara's mouth twisted with the distaste of people appreciating her for having done something compassionate. We are all glad your spirit had not yet left you, so you could stay, Du Shailu. Lord Rawl's baby, too. Chapter 34 
Not far off, Du Shailu was being tended to by the blade masters and most of the hunters. The Baka Tau Mana spirit woman had returned from the spirit world, or near to it, and Richard could see she had left behind her warmth. The blankets were insufficient. So Richard had told the men they could make a fire to help warm her if they all stayed together to reduce the chances of any surprises. Two of the mud people cleared grass and dug a shallow pit while the other hunters made tightly wound grass billets. Twisting wrung out most of the moisture. They coated four of the grass bundles in a resinous pitch they carried with them and then stacked them in a pyramid. With those burning, they wind rode the rest of the grass billets around the little fire to dry them out. In short order, they had dry grass for firewood and a good fire going. Du Shai Lu looked like death warmed up a bit. She was still very sick. At least she was alive. Her breathing was better, if interrupted by coughing. The blade masters were seeing to it that she drank hot tea while the hunters turned mother hens, cooked her some tava porridge. It appeared she would recover and remain in the world of life for the time being. Richard found it miraculous to think a person could come alive again after dying. Had someone told him such a thing instead of him seeing it himself, he doubted he would have believed them. In more ways than one, his beliefs had been skewed and his thinking altered. Richard no longer had any doubt as to what they must do. Kara, arms folded, watched the men as they took care of Du Shailu. Kalin, too, was watching with fascination equal to any of the rest of them, except Kara. She didn't think it was at all out of the ordinary for a dead person to breathe again. What was ordinary for a moored Sith seemed very different from what others thought ordinary. Richard gently took a hold of Kalin's arm and pulled her closer. Before, you said no one had gotten past the Domini Dirch in centuries. Did someone once get past them? Kalin turned her attention to him. It's unclear and a matter of dispute, outside of Andereth anyway. Ever since it had first been mentioned by Du Shailu, Richard had gotten the feeling Andereth wasn't Kalin's favorite place. How so? It's a story requiring some explanation. Richard pulled three pieces of tava bread from his pack and handed one each to Kara and Kalin. He settled his gaze on Kalin's face. I'm listening. Kalin twisted a small chunk off her tava bread, apparently pondering how to begin. The land, now known as Andereth, was once invaded by people known as the Hakens. The people of Andereth teach that the Hakens used the Domini Dirch against the people who were then living there, those people now called the Anders. When I was young and studied at the keep, the wizards taught me differently. Either way, it was many centuries ago. History has a way of getting muddled by those controlling the teaching of it. For example, I would venture the Imperial Order will teach a very different account of Renwald than we would teach. I'd like to hear about Andereth history, he said, as she ate the chunk of tava bread she had torn off. About the history as the wizards taught you. Kalin swallowed before she began. Well, centuries ago, maybe as long as two to three thousand years ago, the Haken people came out of the wilds and invaded Andereth. It's thought they were a remote people whose land possibly became unsuitable for some reason. Such a thing has happened in other places. For example, when a river's course is changed by an earthquake or flood. Sometimes a formerly productive area will become too dry to support farming or animals. Sometimes crops fail and people will migrate. Anyway, according to what I was taught, the Hakens somehow made it past the Domini Dirch. How, no one knows. Many of them were slaughtered, but they somehow finally made it past and conquered the land now known as Andereth. The Anders were a mostly nomadic people, composed of tribes who fought fiercely among themselves. They were uneducated in things like written language, metalworking, construction and such, and they had little social organization. In short, compared to the Haken invaders, they were a backward people. It wasn't that they weren't smart, just that the Hakens were a people possessed of advanced learning and methods. Haken weapons were also superior. They had cavalry, for example, and they had a better grasp of coordination and tactics on a large scale. They had a clear command structure, whereas the Anders bickered endlessly over who would direct their forces. That was one reason the Hakens, once past the Domini Dirch, were easily able to bring the Anders to heel. Richard handed Kalin a water skin. The Hakens were a people of war and conquest, I take it. 
They lived by conquest? Kaylin wiped water that was dribbling down her chin. No, they weren't the type to conquer simply for booty and slaves. They didn't make war for mere predation. They brought with them their knowledge of everything, from making leather shoes to working iron. They were a literate people. They had an understanding of higher mathematics and how to apply it to endeavors such as architecture. Their core skill was farming on a large scale, with plows pulled by oxen and horses, rather than hand-hoed gardens like the Anders kept to supplement their hunting and gathering of things growing wild. The Hakens created irrigation systems and introduced rice in addition to other crops. They knew how to develop and select better strains of crops such as wheat to give them the best use of land and weather. They were experts at horse breeding. They knew how to breed better livestock and raised vast herds. Kaylin handed back the water skin and ate a bite of tava bread. She gestured with the half-eaten tava. As is the way of conquest, the Hakens ruled as victors often do. Haken ways supplanted Ander ways. Peace came to the land, albeit peace enforced by Haken overlords. They were harsh, but not brutal. Rather than slaughtering the Anders, as was the custom of many conquering invaders, they enfolded the Anders into Haken society, even if it was at first as cheap labor. Richard spoke with his mouth full. The Anders, too, benefited from the Haken ways, then? Yes. Under direction of the Haken overlords, food was plentiful. Both the Haken and the Ander people prospered. The Anders had been a sparse population, always on the brink of vanishing. With abundant food, the population multiplied. When Du Shailu fell to a coughing fit, they turned to her. Richard squatted and dug through his pack until he found a cloth packet Nissel had given them. Unrolling it, he found inside some of the leaves Nissel had once given him to calm pain. Kalin pointed out the ground herbs supposed to settle the stomach. He tied some into a cloth and handed the bag of ground herbs to Kara. Tell the men to put this in the tea and let it steep for a bit. It will help her stomach. Tell Chandalin that Nissel gave it to us. He can explain it to Du Shailu's men, so they won't worry. Kara nodded. He put the leaves in her palm. Tell her that after she drinks the tea, she should chew one of these leaves. It will calm her pain. Later, if she is sick at her stomach again, or in pain, she can chew another. Kara hurried to the task. Kara would likely not admit it, but Richard knew she would appreciate the satisfaction of giving assistance to someone in need. He couldn't imagine how much greater the satisfaction would be to bring a person back to life. So what happened then with the Hakens and the Anders? Everything went well? The Anders learned from the Hakens? He picked up his tava bread for a bite. Brotherhood and peace? For the most part. The Hakens brought with them orderly rule, where before the Anders squabbled among themselves, often leading to bloody conflicts. The invading Hakens had actually killed fewer Anders than the Anders themselves regularly killed in their own territorial wars. At least so said the wizards who taught me. Though I'm not saying it was by any means entirely fair or equitable, the Hakens did have a system of justice. It was more than the simple mob rule of the Anders, or the right of the strongest. Once they had conquered the Anders and shown them their ways, they taught the Anders to read. The Anders, who had been a backward people, may have been ignorant, but they are a very clever people. They may not devise things on their own, but they are quick to grasp a better way and make it their own on a whole new scale. In that way, they are brilliant. Richard waved his rolled-up tava bread. So why isn't it called Hakenland or something? I mean, you said the vast majority of people in Andorith are Haken. That's later. I'm coming to it. Kalin pulled off another chunk of tava. The way the wizards explained it to me was that the Hakens had a system of justice which, once they settled in Andorith, and with the spreading prosperity, only became better. Justice from the invaders? Civilization does not unfold fully developed, Richard. It's a building process. Part of that process is the mixing of peoples, and that mixing is often via conquest. But it can often bring new and better ways. You can't impulsively judge situations by such simple criteria as invasion and conquest. But if one people comes in and forces another people, look at Tahara. Because of conquest, by you, it is coming to be a place of justice, where torture and murder are no longer the way of rule. Richard wasn't about to argue that point. I suppose. 
but it just seems such a shame for a culture to be destroyed by another that invades them. It isn't fair. She gave him one of her looks akin to looks Zed sometimes gave him, a look that said she hoped he would see truth rather than repeat by rote a popular but misguided notion. For that reason, he listened carefully as she spoke. Culture carries no privilege to exist. Cultures do not have value simply because they are. Some cultures, the world is better off without. She lifted an eyebrow. I submit for your consideration the imperial order. Richard let out a long breath. I see what you mean. He took a swig of water as she ate some more tava. It still seemed somehow wrong to him for a culture, with its own history and traditions, to be wiped out, but he understood to an extent what she was saying. So the Ander way of life ceased to be. You were saying about the Haken system of justice? Despite what we may now think of how they came to be there, the Hakens were a people who valued fairness. In fact, they considered it essential to an orderly and prosperous society. Thus, over time, subsequent generations of Hakens gave increasing freedoms to the Anders they had conquered, eventually coming to view them as equals. Those subsequent generations came to share sensibilities similar to ours, and also came to feel shame at what their ancestors had done to the Ander people. Kalin gazed out over the plains. Of course, it's easier to feel shame if those guilty are centuries dead, especially when such discrediting, by default, confers upon yourself a higher moral standard without having to stand the test in the true environment of the time. Anyway, their adherence to their notion of justice turned out to be the beginning of the downfall of the Haken people. The Anders, because of their conquest, always hated the Hakens, and never ceased to harbor a hunger for revenge. One of the hunters who had been cooking up porridge brought over a warm piece of tava bread cupped in each hand and heaped with thick steaming porridge. Kalin and Richard each gratefully took the hot food, and she thanked him in his language. So how could a Haken system of justice, Richard said, after they had each eaten some of the porridge laced with sweet dried berries, result in the Hakens now being virtual slaves because of the Anders' sense of justice. That just doesn't seem possible. He saw that Du Shailu, wrapped in blankets beside the fire, wasn't interested in porridge. Kara had steeped the tea with the bag of herbs and was hunkered beside Du Shailu, seeing to it that she at least sipped some from a small wooden cup. A system of justice was not the cause of the Haken downfall, Richard. Merely a step along the way, one of the bare bones of history. I'm only telling you the salient points, the results. Such shifts in culture and society take place over time. Because of fair laws, the Anders were able to make advances that in the end resulted in them being able to seize power. Anders are no different than anyone else in their hunger for power. The Hakens were a ruling people. How did it get from there to the other way round? Richard shook his head. He had a hard time believing it was as the wizards portrayed it. There is more in the middle. Kalin licked porridge off a finger. Once the Anders had access to fair laws, it became for them the sharp end of a wedge. Once folded into the society, Anders used their freedom to gain status. At first it was participation in business, the labor trades, which became guilds, and membership on small local councils, things like that, one step at a time. Make no mistake, the Anders worked hard, too. Because the laws became fair to all, they were able to gain through their own hard work the same sorts of things the Hakens had. They became successful and respected. Most importantly, though, they became the moneylenders. You see, the Anders, it turned out, had a talent for business. Over time, they became the merchant class instead of simply the working class. Being the merchants enabled families over time to acquire fortunes. They eventually became money lenders, and thus a financial power. A few large and extensive Ander families controlled much of the finances and were to a large extent the unseen power behind Haken rule. Hakens grew complacent, while the Anders remained focused. Anders also became teachers. Almost from the beginning, the Hakens considered teaching a simple role the Ander people should be allowed to fill, freeing Hakens for more adult matters of rule. The Anders took on all aspects of teaching, not just the teaching itself, incrementally gaining control of the instruction of fit teachers and therefore of the curriculum. 
Richard swallowed a mouthful of porridge. I take it that was, for the Hakens, somehow a mistake? With her half-eaten tava bread plate of porridge, Kaylin gestured for emphasis. Besides reading and math, the children were taught history and culture, ostensibly so they would grow up to understand their place in their land's culture and society. The Hakens wanted all children to learn a better way than war and conquest. They believed the Ander teachings of brutal Haken conquest at the expense of noble Ander people would help their children to grow up to be civilized with respect for others. Instead, the guilt it put on young minds contributed to the erosion of the cohesive nature of Haken society and of respect for the authority of Haken rule. And then came a cataclysmic event, a ruinous decade-long drought. It was during this drought that the Anders finally made their move to oust Haken rule. The entire economy was based on the production of crops, wheat mostly. Farms failed, and farmers were unable to deliver export crops for which the merchants had already paid them. Debts were called due as everyone tried to survive the hard times. Many without great financial resources lost their farms. There might have been government controls placed on the economic system to slow the panic, but the ruling Hakens feared to displease the moneylenders who backed them. And then, worse problems erupted. People began dying. There were food riots. Fairfield was burned to the ground. Haken and Ander alike rose up in violent, lawless rioting. The land was in chaos. Many people left for other lands, hoping to find a new life before they starved. The Anders, though, used their money to buy food from abroad. Only the financial resources of the wealthy Anders could purchase food from afar, and it was that food supply that was the only hope of survival for most people. The Anders, with this supply of food from abroad, were seen as the hand of salvation. The Anders bought out failed businesses and farms from people desperate for money. The Anders' money, meager as it was, and their food supply, was the only thing keeping most families from starving. It was then the Anders began to extract the true price and their vengeance. The government, run by the Hakens, was blamed by the mobs in the streets for the starvation. Anders, with their merchant connections, fomented and spread the insurrection from place to place. Anarchy befell the land as the Haken rulers were put to death in the streets, their bodies dragged before cheering crowds. Haken intellectuals drew the bloodlust of frightened people for somehow being responsible for the starvation. Well-educated Hakens were viewed as enemies of the people, even by the majority of Hakens who were farmers and laborers. The purge of the learned Hakens was bloody. In the rioting and lawlessness, the entire Haken ruling class was systematically murdered. Every Haken of accomplishment was suspect and so put to death. The Anders swiftly ruined by either financial means or violent mobs, any Haken business or concern left. In the vacuum, the Anders seized power and brought order with food for starving people, Ander and Haken alike. When the dust settled, the Anders were in control of the land, and with strong forces of mercenaries they could afford to hire, soon held the land in an iron grip. Richard had stopped eating. He could hardly believe what he was hearing. He stared transfixed, as Kaylin swept her hand expansively in telling of the downfall of reason. Anders changed the order of everything, making black white and white black. They declared no Haken could fairly judge an Ander because of the ancient Haken tradition of injustice to Anders. Conversely, Anders asserted, because they had for so long been subjugated by their wicked Haken overlords that they understood the nature of inequity and so would be the only ones qualified to rule in matters of justice. Woeful tales of Haken cruelty were the currency of social acceptance. Frightened Hakens, in an attempt to prove the horrific charges untrue and avoid being singled out by the well-armed troops, willingly submitted to Ander authority and those merciless mercenaries. The Anders, so long out of power, were ruthless in pressing their advantage. Haken people were forbidden to hold positions of power, Eventually, supposedly because the Haken overlords required Anders to address those overlords by surname, even the right to have a surname was denied the Hakens, unless they somehow proved themselves worthy and received special permission. But haven't they intermixed? Richard asked. 
After all that time, didn't the Haken and Ander people intermarry? Didn't they all blend together into one people? Kaelin shook her head. From the beginning, the Anders, a tall, dark-haired people, thought wedding the red-headed Hakens was a crime against the Creator. They believed the Creator, in his wisdom, made people distinct and different. They didn't believe people should interbreed like livestock being bred for a new quality, which was what the Hakens had done. I'm not saying it didn't occasionally happen, but to this day such a thing is rare. Richard rolled up his last bite of tava with porridge. So, what's it like there now? He popped the bite in his mouth. Since only the downtrodden, the Anders, can be virtuous, because they were oppressed, only they are allowed to rule. They teach that Haken oppression continues to this day. Even a look from a Haken can be interpreted as a projection of hate. Conversely, Hakens cannot be downtrodden and thus virtuous, since by nature they are corrupt. It's now against the law for Hakens to learn to read. Out of fear, they would again seize rule and go on to brutalize and butcher the Ander people, as surely as night always extinguishes day, to put their words to it. Hakens are required to attend classes called penance assembly, to keep them in line. It's all systematized and codified the way Anders now rule Hakens. Keep in mind, Richard, the history I told you is what was taught me by the wizards. What the Anders teach is quite different. They teach that they were an oppressed people who by their own higher nature have, after centuries of domination, once again exerted their cultural superiority. For all I know, their version could even be true. Richard was standing, hands on hips, staring incredulously. And the council in Aidendrill allowed this? They allowed the Anders to enslave the Haken people in such a fashion? The Hakens meekly submit. They believe, as they were taught by Ander teachers, that this is a better way. But how could the Central Council allow such a perversion of justice? You forget, Richard. The Midlands was an alliance of sovereign lands. The Confessors helped see to it that rule in the Midlands was, to a certain extent, fair. We did not tolerate murder of political opponents, things like that. But if a people like the Hakens willingly went along with the way their land worked, the Council had little say. Brutal rule was opposed. Bizarre rule was not. Richard threw up his hands. But the Hakens only go along because they are taught this nonsense. They don't know how ridiculous it is. It is the equivalent of the abuse of an ignorant people. Abuse may be to you, Richard. They see it differently. They see it as a way to peace in their land. That is their right. The fact they were deliberately taught in a way to make them ignorant is proof of the abuse. She tilted her head toward him. Aren't you the one who just told me the Hakens had no right to destroy the Ander culture? Now you argue the council should have done no less? Richard's face reflected frustration. You were talking about the council of the Midlands? Kalin took another drink and then handed him the water skin. This all happened centuries ago. No one land was strong enough to enforce law on the rest of the Midlands. Together, through the council, we simply tried to work together. The confessors interceded when rulers stepped outside the bounds. Had we tried to dictate how each sovereign land was to be ruled, the alliance would have fallen apart and war would have replaced reason and cooperation. I'm not saying it was perfect, Richard, but it allowed most people to live in peace, he sighed. I suppose. I'm no expert on governing. I guess it served the people of the Midlands for thousands of years. Kalin picked at her tava bread. Things like what happened in Andorith are one reason I came to understand and believe in what you are trying to accomplish, Richard. Until you came along, with Dahara behind your word, no one land was strong enough to set down just law for all peoples. Against a foe like Jagang, the alliance of the Midlands has no chance. Richard couldn't really imagine how it must have been for her, as Mother Confessor, to see what she had worked for her entire life fall apart. Richard's father, Dark and Rall, had set in motion events that had altered the world. Kalin, at least, had seen the opportunity in the chaos. Richard rubbed his brow as he considered what to do next. All right, so I now understand a bit about the history of Andorith. I'm sure that if I knew the history of Dahara, I'd find that far more sordid. And yet they now follow me and struggle for justice. Strange as I realize that sounds. 
The spirits know some people have hung the crimes of Dahara's past around my raw neck. From what you've told me of Andereth history, they sound like a people who would never submit to the rule of the Imperial Order. Do you think we can get Andereth to join with us? Kalin took a deep breath as she considered it. He had been hoping she would say yes without having to think about it. They are ruled by a sovereign who is also their religious leader. That element of their society harkens back to the religious beliefs of the Anders. The directors of the Office of Cultural Amity hold sway over who will be named sovereign for life. The directors are supposed to be a moral check on the man appointed sovereign, in a way like the first wizard selecting the right person to be seeker. The Andereth people believe that once anointed by the directors, the man named sovereign transcends mere matters of the flesh and is in touch with the Creator himself. Some fervently believe he speaks in this world for the Creator. Some view him with the reverence they would reserve for the Creator himself. So he's the one who will need to be convinced to join us? In part. But the sovereign doesn't really rule in the day-to-day -day sense. He's more a figurehead loved by the people for what he represents. Nowadays, Anders make up less than maybe 15 or 20 percent of the population, but the Hakens feel much the same about their sovereign. He has the power to order the rest of the government to a course, but more often he simply approves the one they select. For the large part, the ruling of Andereth is done by the Minister of Culture. The minister sets the agenda for the land. That would be a man named Bertrand Chanbur. The Minister of Culture's office just outside Fairfield is the governing body that ultimately would make the decision. The representatives I met with in Aidendrill will report our words to Minister Chanbur. No matter the dim history, the present-day fact is that Andrith is a power to be reckoned with. If the ancient Anders were a primitive people, they are no longer so. They are wealthy merchants who control vast trade and wealth. They govern with equal skill. They have a secure grip on their power and their land. Richard scanned the empty grasslands. Ever since the chime had come to kill Du Shailu, and he had felt the hairs at the back of his neck stand on end, he kept checking for the feeling, hoping that if it came again he would be aware of the sensation sooner and be able to warn everyone in time. He glanced over to see Kara feeding Du Shailu porridge. She needed to be back with her people not carrying her unborn child all over the countryside. The Anders are not fat, soft, lazy merchants either, Kalin went on. Except for the army, where a semblance of equality exists, only Anders are allowed to carry weapons, and they tend to be good with them. The Anders, despite what you may think of them, are no fools, and neither are they to be easily won over. Richard again gazed out over the grasslands as he made plans in his head. In Ebenissia, in Renwald, he said, Jagang has shown what he does to people who refuse to join him. If Andereth doesn't join us, they will again fall to a foreign invasion. This time, though, the invaders will have no sense of justice. Chapter 35 Richard, considering everything Kalin had told him, and what the Chimes had in their own brutal way told him, stood staring off toward Aidendrill. Learning some of the history of Andereth only made him feel more sure of his decision. I knew we had to be going the wrong way, he said at last. Kalin frowned out over the empty plains to the northeast where he was looking. What do you mean? Zed used to tell me that if the road is easy, you're likely going the wrong way. Richard, we've been all through that, Kalin said with weary insistence as she pushed her cloak back over her shoulder. We need to get to Aidendrill. Now more than ever, you must see that. The mother confessor is right, Kara said, returning from Du Shailu, now that the woman was resting. Richard noticed that Kara's knuckles were white around her aegeal. These chimes must be banished. We must help Zed set the magic right again. Oh, really? You don't know, Kara, how pleased I am to hear that you are now such a devotee of magic. Richard looked around, checking for their gear. I have to go to Andorath. Richard, we very well could be leaving inactive in Aidendrill a spell that would be the solution to the chimes. I'm the seeker, remember? Richard was thankful for Kalin's counsel, and he highly valued it. But now that he had heard what she had to say, analyzed the options, and made his decision, his patience was at an end. 
It was time to act. Let me do my job. Richard, this is... You once swore an oath before Zed. Pledged your life in the defense of the Seeker. You thought it that important. I'm not asking for your life. Only your understanding that I'm doing as I must. Kalin took a breath, trying to be tolerant and calm with him when he was hardly hearing her. Zed urged us to do this for him so he would be able to counter the ebbing of magic. She tugged his sleeve to get his attention. We can't all go rushing off to Andorith. You're right. Kalin frowned suspiciously. Good. We're not all going to Andorith. Richard found their blanket and snatched it up. As you said, Aidendrill is important too. Kalin seized the front of his shirt and hauled him around to face her. Oh, no, you don't. She shook her finger in his face. Oh, no, you don't, Richard. We're married. We've been through too much. We're not going to separate now. Not now. And certainly not just because I'm angry with you for forgetting to tell Zed about your first wife. I'll not have it, Richard. Do you hear me? Kalin, this has nothing to do. Her green eyes afire. She shook him by his shirt. I'll not have it. Not after all it took for us to be together. Richard glanced at Kara not far away. Only one of us needs to go to Aidendrill. He took her hand from his shirt, giving it a little squeeze of reassurance before she could say anything more. You and I are going to Andorith. Kalin's brow twitched. But if we both... She suddenly looked over at Kara. Alarm shifted to the moored Sith. Why are you both looking at me like that? Richard put an arm around Kara's shoulders. She didn't seem to like it one bit, so he took the arm away. Kara, you have to go to Aidendrill. We are all going to Aidendrill. No, Kalin and I must go to Andorith. They have the Domini Dirch. They have an army. We have to get them to join us and then prepare them for the coming of the Order. I need to see if there's anything there that will help stop the chimes. We're a lot closer to Andorith now than I would be if I had to go there from Aidendrill. I can't not look into it. It could be that we can stop the chimes and Andorith will surrender and we will be able to use the Domini Dirch to halt or even destroy Jagang's army. Too much is at stake to let such opportunity slip through our fingers. It's too important, Kara. Surely you can see I have no choice? No, you have a choice. We can all go to Aidendrill. You are Lord Rall. I am Mord Sith. I must stay with you to protect you. Would you rather I sent Kaelin? Kara pressed her lips tight but didn't answer. Kalin took him by his arm. Richard, as you said, you are the Seeker. You need your sword. Without it, you are vulnerable. It's in Aidendrill. So is the bottle with the spell, and Colo's journal, and libraries of other books that may hold the answer. We have to go to Aidendrill. Had you only told Zed, we might not be in this position, but now that we are, we must do as he asked. Richard straightened and looked her in the eye as she folded her arms. Kalin... I'm the Seeker. As the Seeker, I have an obligation to do what I think is right. I admit I made a mistake before, and I'm sorry, but I can't allow that mistake to make me flinch from my duty as I believe it to be. As the Seeker, I'm going to Andorith. As Mother Confessor, you must do what your heart and duty dictate. I understand that. I want you with me. But if you must take another path, I will still love you the same. He leaned closer to her choose. Her arms still folded, Kalin regarded him in silence. At last, her ire melted and she nodded. She glanced briefly at Kara. Seeming to think there was one person too many for the delivery of the inevitable orders, she spoke to him in a low voice. I'm going to see how Du Shailu is getting on. When Kalin was out of earshot, Kara began to speak. My duty is to guard and protect the Lord Rall, and I will not... Richard held up a hand to silence her. Kara, please listen to me a minute. We've been through a lot together, the three of us. The three of us have been to the brink of death together. We each have the others to thank in more ways than one for our lives today. You are more to us than a guard, and you know it. Kaelin is your sister of the Aegeal. You are my friend. I know I mean more to you than simply being your Lord Rall. Or with the bond gone, you wouldn't have to stay with me. We are all bonded in friendship. That is why I cannot leave you. I will not leave you, Lord Rall. I will guard you whether or not you allow it. How does it feel to be without your Aegeal? She didn't answer. 
It looked as if she didn't trust herself to try to speak. Kara, would it surprise you to learn I feel the same way about the Sword of Truth? I have been without it longer than you have been without your Aegeal. It's an awful gnawing feeling in the pit of my stomach. A constant empty ache, like I need nothing so much as to feel that terrible thing in my hand. The same with you? She nodded. Kara, I hate that sword. The same as you, surely somewhere inside must hate your Aegeal. One time you surrendered it to me, remember? You and Berdeen and Raina? I asked you to forgive me that I had to ask you to keep your weapon for now to help us in our struggle. I remember. I would like nothing more than not to need the sword. I would like the world to be at peace, and I could put that weapon in the keep and leave it there. But I need it, Kara, just as you need your Aegeal, just as you feel an emptiness without it, feel vulnerable and defenseless and afraid and ashamed to admit it. I feel the same. Just as you need your Aegeal because you want nothing more than to protect us, I need my sword to protect Kaelin. If anything happened to her because I didn't have my sword, Kara, I care about you. That's why it's important for you to understand. You are no longer just Mord Sith, just our protector. You are more than that now. It's important for you to think and not simply to react. You must be more than Mord Sith if you are to be of true help as our protector. I'm depending on you to continue to be an important person in this struggle, a person who can make a difference. Now you must go to Aidendril in my place. I won't follow those orders. I'm not ordering you, Kara. I'm asking you. That is not fair. This isn't a game, Kara. I'm asking for your help. You are the only one I can turn to. She scowled off toward the thunderstorm on the distant horizon as she pulled her long blonde braid over her shoulder. She gripped it in her fist the way she gripped her Aegeal in the heat of anger. The breeze fluttered the wisps of blonde hair along the side of her face. If you wish it, Lord Rall, I will go. Richard put a comforting hand on the back of her shoulder. This time she didn't tense, but welcomed the hand. What do you wish me to do there? I want you to get there and back as soon as possible. I need my sword. I understand. When Kalen glanced their way, Kara signaled for her, and Kalen returned at a trot. Kara stiffened her back as she addressed Kalen. Lord Rall has ordered me to return to Edendril. Ordered? Kalen asked. Kara simply smirked. She lifted the Aegeal at Kalen's chest. For a woods guide, he gets himself in a lot of trouble. As a sister of the Aegeal, I would ask you to watch over him in my place. But I know I do not need to say the words. I won't let him out of my sight. You need to catch up with General Rybish's army first, Richard said. You can get horses from him and make better time to aid and drill. But I also very much need him to know what we're doing. Tell him the whole story. Tell Verna and the sisters, too. They will need to know, and they may have knowledge that would be of use. Richard stared off toward the southwest horizon. I also need an escort, if we are to march into Andorith and demand their surrender. Don't worry, Lord Rall. I intend on ordering Rybish to send men to guard you. They will not be as good as having a moored Sith near, but they will still protect you. I need enough for an impressive escort. When we march into Andorith, I think it would be best if we looked serious, rather than just Kalen and me and a few guards going alone, especially since Kalen's power could fail at any time. I want to look to the people there like we mean business. Now you are beginning to make sense, Kara said. A thousand men should do for an impressive escort, Kalen said. Swordsmen, lancers, and archers, their best. And extra horses, of course. And we'll need messengers. We have important news of the chimes and Jagang that must be sent out. We need to coordinate our forces and keep everyone informed. We have armies in various lands we may need to bring south at once. Kara nodded. I will personally select the soldiers to be sent for your escort. Rybish will have elite troops. Fine, but I don't want his fighting ability harmed by taking key men, Richard said. Tell the general I also want him to send detachments to watch the routes north from the old world he had intended to watch, just in case. The more important thing, though, is that I want his main force to turn around and head back this way. Is he to be allowed to attack at will? No. I don't want him risking his army against the order out on these plains. It would be too costly. 
As good as his men are, they wouldn't stand a chance against a force the size of the orders until we can get more men down here. More importantly, I don't want him attacking because his greatest value is if Jagang doesn't know Rybish's force is there. I want Rybish to come west, shadowing Jagang, but staying north and remaining well away. Tell him to use as few scouts as possible, just enough to keep track of the order, no more. Jagang mustn't know Rybish's force is there. Those Daharan men will be all that stands between the order and the Midlands if Jagang suddenly turns north. Surprise will be his only ally until we can get messengers to bring in more troops. I don't want to risk Rybish's men if it isn't absolutely necessary, but I need him to be the stopgap if things go wrong. If Anderith surrenders, we can combine their army with ours. If we can banish the Chimes, have the Anderith army under our command, and get more of our other forces down here in time, we might even be able to trap Jagang's army with the ocean at his back. It might even be possible to then use our forces to drive him into the teeth of the Domini Dirch. That weapon could kill without our men losing their lives to do it. And in Aden Drill? Kara asked. You heard Zed explain what must be done? Yes. On the fifth column on the left, inside the first wizard's enclave, sits a black bottle with a gold filigree top. It must be broken with the Sword of Truth. Berdine and I have gone with you to the first wizard's enclave. I remember well the place. Good. You can use the sword to break the bottle as well as I. She nodded. Just set the bottle on the ground like Zed told us. Get the sword and break the bottle. I can do that, Kara said. Richard knew very well how much Kara didn't like to have anything to do with magic. He remembered well, too, how he and Berdine hadn't liked going into the first wizard's enclave. There was also the matter of the keep's shields of magic. If the magic of the keep is really down, you won't have any trouble getting through the shields. They will be down too. I remember what they feel like. I will know if they are still alive with magic or if I can pass. Tell Berdine everything you know about the chimes. She may already have valuable information. If nothing else, she has Colo's journal. And with what you tell her, she will know what to search for. Richard held up a finger for emphasis. With his other hand, he gripped her shoulder. But before Berdeen, the sword and the bottle first. Don't let either sit vincible for one moment longer than necessary. The chimes may try to stop you. Be aware of that. Be alert and on guard. Stay away from water and fire as best as you can. Don't take anything for granted. They may know the spell in the bottle can harm them. Before you leave, we will talk to Du Shai Lu and see if she can shed light on how they seduce a person to their death. If she can remember, that may be valuable in warding the chimes. Kara nodded. If she was afraid, she didn't show it. Once I get to General Rybish, I will ride like the wind. I will go first to the keep and get your sword, and then break the bottle. After that, I will bring your sword, Berdine, and the book. Where will I find you? In Fairfield, Kalin said. Most likely with our troops not far out of the city, near the Minister of Culture's estate. If we have to depart, we will leave a message for you, or some of our men. If we can't do that, we will try to tell General Rybish. Richard hesitated. Kara, you will need to take the sword from its scabbard to break the bottle. Of course. But be careful, it's a weapon of magic. And Zed thinks it will still work, still have magic. Kara sighed with unpleasant thoughts. What will it do when I draw it? I don't know for sure, Richard said. It may react to different people in different ways, depending on what they bring to the completion of the magic. I'm still the seeker, but it may work for anyone holding it. I just don't know how its magic will affect you. But it's a weapon that uses rage. Just be careful and realize that it will want to draw you out, much as you draw it out. It will foment your emotions, especially your anger. Kara's blue eyes gleamed. It will not have to try hard, Richard smiled. Just be careful. After you break the bottle, don't take the sword from its scabbard for any reason less than a matter of life or death. If you kill with it... Her brow drew down when his voice trailed off. If I kill with it, what? Richard had to tell her, lest she do something dangerous. It gives pain. Like an Aegeel? He nodded reluctantly. Maybe worse. 
His voice lowered as the memories flooded back. Anger is required to counter the pain. If you are filled with righteous rage, that will protect you. But, dear spirits, it will still hurt you. I am Mord Sith. I will welcome the pain. Richard tapped the center of his chest. It hurts you in here, Kara. You don't want that kind of pain, believe me. Better your Aegeal. She gave him a sad smile of understanding. You need your sword, I will bring it to you. Thank you, Kara. But I will not forgive you for making me leave you without protection. You will not be without protection. They all turned. It was Du Shailu. She was pale, her hair a mess, but wrapped in a blanket she no longer shivered. Her face was a picture of grim determination. Richard shook his head. You need to go back to your people. We go with my husband. We protect the Kaharan. Richard decided not to argue the husband part. We'll have troops with us before we can get to Andereth. They are not blade masters. We will take Kara's place protecting you. Kara bowed her head to Du Shailu. This is good. I will rest better knowing you and your blade masters do this. Richard shot Kara an annoyed glance before turning his attention to the Baka Taomana spirit woman. Du Shailu, now that you're safe, I'll not have you risking your lives needlessly. You've already had a brush with death. You must get back to your people. They need you. We are the walking dead. It does not matter. What are you talking about? Du Shailu clasped her hands. The blade masters were spread out behind her, her royal escort. Beyond them, the mud people hunters watched. As sick as she still looked, Du Shailu was once again looking noble. Before we left, she said, we told our people we were dead. We told them we were lost to the world of life, and we would not be returned to them unless we reached the Kaharan to warn him and make sure he was safe. Our people wept and mourned us before we departed because we are dead to them. Only if we do as we said will we be able to return. Not long ago I heard the chimes of death. Kara, the Kaharan's protector, pulled me back from the spirit world. The spirits in their wisdom allowed me to return so I might fulfill my duty. When Kara returns with your sword and you are safe, only then can we have our lives returned to us so that we might return home. Until then, we are the walking dead. I am not asking if we may be allowed to travel with you. I am telling you that we are going to travel with you. I am the Bakataumana spirit woman. I have spoken. Clenching his teeth, Richard lifted his hand to shake an angry finger at her. Kalin caught his wrist. Du Shailu, Kalin said. I too have taken such an oath. When I went to the walled city of Ebenissia and saw the people butchered by the imperial order, I vowed vengeance. Chandelin and I came across a small army of young recruits who also had seen the dead of their home city. They were determined to punish the men responsible. I swore a covenant that I was dead and could only be returned to life when the men who committed those crimes were punished. The men with me gave up their lives too to live again only if we succeeded. One in five of those young men returned to the living with Chandelin and me. But before we did, Every one of the men who murdered the people of Ebenissia died. I understand such an oath as you have given, Du Shailu. Such a thing is sacred and not to be ignored. You and the Blade Masters may come with us. Du Shailu bowed to Kalin. Thank you for honoring my people's ways. You are a wise woman and worthy of being wife to my husband, too. Richard rolled his eyes. Kalin, the mud people need Chandelin and his men. Kara is doing as you ask of her and going to General Rybish and then on to Aidendril. Until the General can send men to join us, we will be alone and vulnerable. Du Shailu and her men will be valuable and welcome protection. With so much at stake, Richard, our pride is the last thing we need to be considering. They are coming. Richard took in Kara's blue eyes, icy cold with resolve. She wanted this. Du Shailu's dark eyes were iron hard. Her mind was made up. Kalin's green eyes... Well, he didn't want to even think about what was in her green eyes. All right, he said. Until the soldiers can reach us, you may come along. Du Shailu directed a puzzled look at Kalin. Does he always tell you, too, things you already know? <laughs> 